All He Wants for Christmas. A Christmas on Palmer Island Romance. Written by Suzanne Ash. Chapter 1. Any word on when you'll cut your demo? Joel picked up his pool cue and lined up the shot. The red number three ball went in the far right corner pocket. Glancing across the table, he picked out his next target. I have something in the works for December 25th. Gotta come up with the money for it by then. Marcel, the owner of the one and only recording studio in the greater Myrtle Beach area, had given him a great deal, because of the date, but it was still a solid chunk of change. Scraping together the $1,500 in two weeks was going to be a challenge. That's Christmas Day, Tony said, leaning up against the table and raising his beer to take a swig. I realize that. Joel looked up at him, aiming his next shot. Do you mind? Tony stepped back, and he went for it. Another score. I should have put money on this, Joel joked. He wasn't serious. This was their time to unwind after the show. The extra cash would have come in handy though. The next one was tricky. He avoided hitting the eight ball and watched the yellow one slowly roll toward the bottom left pocket he had aimed at. It stopped less than a quarter of an inch short. Joel mumbled a curse under his breath. You were saying? Tony smirked and put down his beer. Joel barked out a laugh. Good show tonight. The place was packed. Tony sank one of his balls and nodded. Yep. I'm ready to be done with all the Christmas stuff though. It's gonna be interesting to see what they come up with for the first of the year. Joel wished he could share Tony's enthusiasm. He remembered last year, his first full holiday season at the Carolina Theater, and how fun and exciting it had all seemed. He thought he'd made it, living the dream of making it as a professional musician. A year later, he couldn't see himself doing this for the next 20, 30 years. Playing the exact same show two, sometimes three, times a day, six days a week. It was hard, tedious work. Not at all what he'd imagined life as a singer and guitar player would be like. Are you still playing at that little coffee shop down your way? Tony asked after sinking yet another ball. Joel nodded. The roasted bean is becoming my favorite gig. Fun crowd and good tips. He knew Mitch, the owner of the popular coffee shop on Palmer Island, just down the road from his little efficiency apartment. He'd found the place a few months before the theater had hired him, and the low rent made it worth driving 50 minutes to work each day. How does that work? You just show up and play, or is there a schedule or something? Tony looked up at him. I try to give Mitch a heads up, but he's pretty flexible. I can pop in when I have a couple of hours to play my own stuff. It had saved his sanity since the Christmas season started. He needed to play something other than Jingle Bell Rock and the First Noel or he'd go insane long before Christmas Eve. Let me know if he's looking for someone else to come play, Tony said. Joel nodded. It's not a big payday, but the tips are good, and Mitch doesn't mind if I try to sell my CD. How's that going? People still buy those? Tony looked surprised. Not a lot. Maybe two or three per week? Mostly older folks. Joel watched Tony sink the eight ball and returned his cue to the rack on the wall behind him. Have you been playing anything worthwhile? He asked his friend. Not really. With Kelsey working nights at the hospital, I don't get to head out a lot. Her mom can only babysit for so long. Tony didn't look happy about it. Joel nodded and started to walk back to their table. He couldn't imagine what it was like to raise a couple of kids. I heard good things about that new bar that opened up by the skywheel. Tony pulled out a chair and sat down. Joel nodded. He knew the place. I talked to the owner a couple of days ago. He's booked solid until February. Didn't sound too excited about a solo gig either. He shrugged. Playing in places like the brand new high-end bar were fun. There was usually a big crowd to cheer you on, and the pay was good. 
Landing a spot was tough though unless you made a name for yourself. Another beer? Joel nodded and slid a couple of bucks across the table. Tony was back with two fresh bottles a few minutes later. To making it in the music industry, Joel said, a wry grin on his face. I'll drink to that. Tony tipped his bottle to clank it against Joel's. So far, it isn't what you had in mind when you picked up that guitar of yours, is it? Not quite. I figured I'd have a big record deal by now and a couple of albums out. That's the dream. Doesn't happen for a lot of us, but I think you have a shot at it. You've got talent. And no family to feed. Tony leaned back in his chair. At least the money at the theater is good, and the crowd is fun. They really got into it tonight, didn't they? Joel grinned. They did. Those seniors love their sing-alongs. I hope there's another busload of them tomorrow. They got everyone else going. The energy during a good show, like the one they had early this evening, was why he loved performing. It was intoxicating. He could only imagine what it would be like to perform on a real stage, playing his own music, in front of real fans. That was the dream. One day he'd get there. Joel? He turned his head and saw Russell, one of the other singers in the show, walk up to their table. I have a huge favor to ask. What's that? You're off Friday, right? Joel nodded. It was his only day off this week, aside from Sunday when the coffee shop would be closed. Any chance you could cover for me for the early evening show? Joel wanted to tell him no. He'd planned on working on his music and then play an extra gig at the Roasted Bean. Something in the look on Russell's face made him hesitate. Why do you need to get out of that one show, he asked. They ran three shows on Fridays. One in the early afternoon, the early evening one, and a late show. I promised Ella I'd go see her in her play at school. Freaking Becca didn't tell me about it. I knew nothing about it until Ella asked if I was coming this morning. Russell's fists were clenched tight. He wasn't on the best of terms with his ex-wife. Joel wasn't surprised she'd kept this from him. It wasn't the first time something like this had happened. Sure. I'll cover for you, he said. It would ruin his Friday plans, but Joel couldn't be the reason Russell let Ella down. Thanks, man. I owe you. Joel hoped he wouldn't come up short on cash for the recording gig without the coffee shop tips. This was his shot. He couldn't afford to waste it. Joel pulled open the door to the roasted bean, and the smell of freshly brewed coffee wafted up his nose. A big dose of caffeine was exactly what he needed to make it through rehearsal and three shows today. Especially after the long night with little sleep he'd had. It was worth it though, no matter what. When inspiration struck, you had to take advantage of it. So he'd been up with his guitar and his notes until much too late. You're up early, Mitch called from behind the counter. Joel could see one of the patrons glance at the clock on the wall. Ten o'clock wasn't exactly early for most of the coffee shop crowd. Mitch opened the door at six and there was usually a line. Got rehearsal, he said before ordering an extra large black coffee. Really? Aren't you in the middle of the Christmas show? Mitch looked at him with raised eyebrows. We're reblocking and moving stuff around. Too many people out with the flu. The call had come an hour ago. Two more entertainers had called in sick, and there was no way to run the show without some major adjustments. Mitch nodded. You'll make it work. The boss is good with stuff like that. The gray haired man had been a regular at the Carolina Theater and had put in a good word when Joel applied for the job. Are you playing Friday? Should have a good crowd of people here, with the church running their Christmas craft fair. Wish I could. I ended up picking up an extra shift. You'll be about to close by the time I make it home. Joel pulled out his wallet and paid for his order. That's too bad. Lots of people stop in on their way home. Ended up being one of my most profitable days last year. Tips should be good. 
Mitch knew of the plan to create a demo by the end of the year, and he was right. Playing on a night when the shop was packed would add quite a few dollars to the recording fund. But helping Russell out had been the right call. No doubt about that. He didn't want his little girl scanning the crowd, looking for her dad, and not finding him. He'd been there. It sucked. Yeah, I know, but what can you do? Joel shrugged. He looked up and saw a pretty blonde standing off to the side. She wasn't a regular. He noticed a small suitcase beside her and lost all interest. She must be a tourist. Mitch cleared his throat. Fresh pot of French roast is almost done. I'll have your order up in a couple of minutes. Joel stepped to the side to let the woman order while he waited for his coffee. He glanced down at his phone. He'd cut it close, but barring any traffic issues, he'd make it to work on time. Excuse me, where do you keep the sugar and cream? The young woman next to him asked a few minutes later. Mitch pointed to the side of the counter, and she turned to see where he was pointing. Oh, no. Joel felt the hot liquid pour across his shirt before he saw it. He jumped back, but it was too late. Most of her white chocolate and peppermint latte had poured out. He was wearing at least a third of it now. I'm so sorry. She grabbed a handful of napkins from the dispenser and started to dab at his chest with them. I got it, he said, taking them from her. Mitch stepped around the counter, bucket and cleaning rag in hand. I'll get you a new drink in a second, he said to the woman. You good, Joel? He nodded. I don't know how that happened. She stood there wringing her hands. What can I do to make it up to you? I feel horrible. Don't sweat it. Accidents happen, he said. It's no big deal. I'll change into work clothes in a bit anyway. Can't be wearing this on the job. He pulled on his long sleeve t shirt. It was starting to stick to his chest. The drive up into Myrtle Beach wasn't going to be pleasant, and he'd get some flack for smelling like a piece of Christmas fudge, but he'd live. Are you sure? Can I at least buy you a coffee to make up for it? I'm good. He held out the large cup Mitch had given him. Waiting for the coffee to finish. How about a pastry then? She glanced around the display. Not a breakfast person. Honestly, it's fine. I'm Joel, by the way, Joel Fisher. He wiped the last of the coffee that had poured all over him on his jeans before he held his hand out to her. He hoped it would be only slightly sticky. She didn't hesitate to shake it. Michelle. She hesitated for a moment. Michelle Braxton. Her eyes scanned his face. He wondered what that was about. Mitch walked over with a large container of dark roast black coffee and replaced it with the empty one. You're all set, he said. Joel filled the cup to the top and popped on a lid. He glanced back at his phone. I have to run, or I'll be late for work. Nice meeting you. He turned to walk off. Hang on. Michelle grabbed his arm for a second before she began digging around in her large purse. She pulled out a pen and a small notepad. She scribbled something down before tearing the piece of paper out. Here's my number. Please let me make it up to you. I hate that I ruined your clothes. She looked down his jeans and to his latte-covered shoes. And your sneakers. At least let me take you out to lunch and pay to get those cleaned. She pointed at his shoes. He followed her gaze, and sure enough, there were coffee stains all over his white shoes. He'd have to toss them into the washing machine. Wouldn't be the first time. When you played a fair share of dive bars, you ended up with a little bit of everything poured over your shoes. She didn't need to know that though. Lunch would be nice. I'll call you when I'm on break, Joel said. She beamed back at him. He sauntered out to his car. Despite the coffee accident, his day was suddenly looking up. That smile of hers could light up a room. Chapter 2 Can I help you? The friendly gray-haired woman asked. I'm Michelle Braxton, your new renter. 
I'm not expecting anyone. Are you sure you're at the right house? The woman pointed to the cast iron number screwed to the aged wood siding. This is 186, Pelican Drive. Michelle nodded. The address was correct. Are you Miss Doris? I am. The woman looked her up and down, confusion and curiosity on her face. Michelle held out her phone with the email her dad had forwarded, confirming the reservation. I'll need my glasses to read that. Why don't you come inside, and we'll figure this out. She ushered Michelle into a cozy kitchen. Sit. I'll get us some coffee. Coffee would be nice. After the incident at the roasted bean, she hadn't bothered to take the owner up on the offer to make her a new drink. She'd been too embarrassed and headed to the rental home instead, hoping to check in and take a shower. She'd hoped her father was already there, waiting for her. My dad made the reservations, so it may be in his name. Kurt Smith. Michelle hoped her father had used his usual alias to make the reservation. No, that name doesn't ring a bell. Are you sure he rented with me? I'm booked through the day after Christmas. Miss Dora stood. I'll double check my calendar, just in case. She walked over to the kitchen counter and opened one of the top cabinets. A wall calendar was hanging on the inside. No, nothing. She turned to look at Michelle. How about Stephen Mitchell? Miss Doris raised her eyebrows but didn't say anything. She shook her head. Ray Smith? Why would he use a different name? Miss Doris walked back to the table, her eyes narrowing as she sat down and looked at Michelle. Michelle sighed. This was never an easy conversation. He's a musician, a pretty popular one. He uses fake names to throw off the press and get us some privacy. She looked up. To her relief, Miss Doris's features were relaxing. I see. Any other names you want to try? Michelle thought for a moment. The names she'd rattled off were the ones her father used most often. What else was there? Martin Miller, she guessed. Miss Doris shook her head. That doesn't ring a bell either. This was strange. Her dad wouldn't have emailed the address and contact information if he hadn't booked the place, would he? There was only one other possibility. Maybe he'd booked it under his real name. How about Curtis Martell? She held her breath. Let me think. That does sound familiar. Michelle saw recognition flare in Miss Doris's eyes and braced herself. I did have someone by that name ask about renting the cottage out back. He reserved it way back in April, but then called in late October to cancel. The woman put a finger to her lips, looking thoughtful. Yes, that's right. When Sam called, the cancellation had come through. Sam? A friend of mine who asked if the guest cottage was available. She sent me the young man who's staying here until the day after Christmas. Miss Doris pointed toward the back of the house. I'm curious. If you don't mind me asking, what's your father's real name? Miss Doris leaned forward conspiratorially. Michelle laughed. She'd been holding her breath for nothing. It's Curtis Martell. He's the drummer for Wild Horse. She could tell Miss Doris didn't recognize the name and Michelle could have hugged the older woman. It wasn't very often that someone didn't know all about her rock star dad. But that didn't explain any of this. Are you sure he cancelled? We had plans to meet here for Christmas. Miss Doris walked back to the cabinet and pulled the calendar off the small finishing nail it was hanging from. I'm sure. He called the day before Halloween and told me he wouldn't be able to make the trip. Otherwise, I wouldn't have rented it to Chris. Chris must be the current occupant of the guest cottage, Michelle thought. She slumped back in the chair. I can't believe this, she muttered under her breath before pulling out her phone. She shot her dad a couple of texts asking why he wasn't there, and why he hadn't bothered telling her about cancelling their Christmas trip. No reply, and still nothing to the one she'd sent him earlier that morning after her plane landed, and he was nowhere to be found. The plan had been for him to pick her up at the airport. He didn't tell you? 
Miss Doris asked, putting a hand on Michelle's arm. She shook her head, holding back the tears that threatened to well up in response to the woman's kindness. Why did it still bother her? She should be used to this by now. She looked down at her phone again. Still nothing. She tried again. Michelle, Dad? You didn't forget about Christmas on Palmer Island, did you? Still no response. Part of her had hoped when she'd landed at the airport and he wasn't there that he'd headed to the rental early. That he'd had some journalist or paparazzi on his tail and gone straight there, forgetting to text her. So she'd done what she always did and took care of things herself. She'd rented a car, praying her credit card wouldn't be declined, and driven herself down to Palmer Island. It was her first trip to the South Carolina coast, and she'd liked it. She had no idea what made her dad choose the spot, but it turned out to be lovely. Until now. She wasn't sure what she was supposed to do. She couldn't afford to rent anything, and her return flight wasn't until January 3rd. Everything okay? You look pale. Michelle glanced up from her phone and saw the older woman looking at her with compassion in her eyes. How about I fix us some lunch, and we'll figure this out. Michelle nodded. She'd lost her appetite, but at least it would buy her a little time to come up with some sort of plan. She decided to send one last text. Michelle, I can't believe you ditched me. Again. She dropped her phone into her purse, so mad that she didn't care if he would finally respond or not. She rose and helped Miss Doris put together a light lunch of turkey sandwiches, chips, and sweet tea. Your father didn't say anything to you about his change of plans? Miss Doris asked, while they ate. Not a word. I wouldn't have flown down here if I'd known. Her father had booked the flight back in April, probably around the time he'd made the initial reservation. Honestly, I don't know what to do. I'm stuck here until early January. She'd have to figure out some place to stay, and it had to be cheap. Her first-year teacher salary didn't go very far. Do you know of an inexpensive motel that might have a room? Miss Doris shook her head. Not down here. We only have the one hotel on the island. It's pricey and booked this time of year. That didn't sound promising. Maybe she could drive back up north and find something close to the airport. You're not seriously thinking about staying down here by yourself? Don't you have family elsewhere that you'd want to spend the holidays with? Miss Doris took a bite of her sandwich. Michelle shook her head. Not really. There's just my mom. Miss Doris nodded encouragingly. She got remarried a few years ago. She and her new husband have a house full of kids. Five boys. All under seven. She barked out a laugh, thinking about spending Christmas at her mother's house. I don't think I could take the chaos. I don't blame you, Miss Doris said. I raised two boys, and there were times when I was ready to tear my hair out. I can't imagine five. I'm sure you can't hear yourself think in that house. You can't. I don't want to know what it's like with all of them excited about Santa Claus. Plus, she hadn't been invited. Her mom had built a new life, and Michelle would only get in the way. She was a constant reminder of an earlier, failed marriage. Better to be a bit lonely on Christmas than to feel like a fifth wheel. Tell you what, Miss Doris said, pulling Michelle out of her depressing train of thought. I have an extra room. It's nothing fancy, but it leads out to the side deck, so you'll have a private entrance and there's an attached bathroom. You're welcome to use the kitchen and living room anytime. It's not as nice as the cottage, but you'll at least have a place to stay until you decide what to do. Michelle stared at the older woman, her mouth open. What do you think? Would that work? Of course. She stopped when the sad state of her bank account occurred to her. How much would you charge? Miss Doris looked at her for a moment before replying. We won't worry about that for now. You pay what you can. It's been a few years, but I remember what it's like to be young and penniless. She smiled encouragingly. And who knows, maybe you'll hear from your famous father and we'll have him settle the bill. 
she winked. Michelle couldn't help from laughing. I wouldn't count on that, but I'll pay you no matter what. She didn't care if she had to go find a job waiting tables or wrapping Christmas gifts. Michelle was determined to repay the woman for her kindness, and to do it without relying on her deadbeat dad. They shook hands to seal the deal, and Miss Doris showed her the small bedroom toward the back of the house. It wasn't luxurious, but nicer than the apartment Michelle shared with one of her fellow teachers back home. It would work just fine if she could figure out a way to settle her bill at the end of her stay. Oh, before I forget. My great niece Sarah is staying with me. I'm sure you'll see her around. Can't miss her. She's eight months pregnant. Miss Doris's eyes were twinkling with mirth. I can't wait for the baby to get here. That'll make me a great great aunt. She giggled. Michelle couldn't help but smile and join in the older woman's joy. It made her feel a little better, as did having a place to stay and a plan for the holidays. Michelle couldn't wait for her dad to get in touch. He was in so much trouble. Her phone beeped, and she dug it out of her purse, ready to send a string of texts that would let him know what she thought of being abandoned and forgotten at Christmas. He'd promised this year would be different. To her surprise, the message wasn't from her dad. Joel, still up for a lunch date? Tomorrow? Michelle smiled. I'll let you answer that in private. Come find me if you need anything. There are towels in the bathroom and plenty of snacks in the kitchen. Dinner will be around seven. I'll bring you a house key in a little while. It works this door as well. Miss Doris pointed to the set of French doors on the far side of the room and left, closing the door behind her. Michelle dropped her purse on the small desk that occupied one side of the back wall and flopped across the bed. She looked back at her phone and smiled. She liked the blonde man with the pretty smile who hadn't seemed too upset that she spilled hot, sticky coffee all over him. She didn't think he'd get back in touch and take her up on the offer. She'd been wrong, but things had started to look up. Maybe her Christmas break wouldn't be a complete disaster after all. Michelle, name the place, and I'll be there. Michelle groped around blindly for her phone in the dark room. She glanced down at the brightly lit screen when she found it. Why was her dad calling at three in the morning? Hello. Her voice was rough from sleep. I just landed in London. What's going on? What are you doing on Palmer Island? Her father sounded less concerned and more exasperated. Michelle sat up and tried to clear her head. You're in London? London, England? Of course I am. I have the big charity gig out here for Boxing Day. I've been in the air for the last 12 hours. He sounded tired and a little aggravated. It explained why he hadn't answered any of her text messages. I thought you'd be spending Christmas with your mom. I texted you as soon as this London thing came up. Michelle sat up and shoved one of the pillows behind her back. No, you didn't. I wouldn't be here, relying on the kindness of strangers if you'd actually let me know our Christmas trip was off. What do you mean, relying on strangers? She could hear actual concern in her father's voice. Served him right. Miss Doris, the nice older lady whose guest cottage you were going to rent is letting me stay in her spare room. She had no idea I was coming. There was silence on the other end of the line. She could picture her dad shoving his hand up in his hair, pushing the long strands back. He always did that when he knew he'd messed up or when he was exasperated with his only daughter. Why didn't you stay in the cottage? I'll pay for it. Michelle heard him digging around in a bag or something at the other end of the line. Probably looking for his credit card. Michelle shook her head. That was her dad's default reaction to anything to do with her. Hand over his black American Express card. She smiled at the thought it wouldn't do him any good this time. Because it's occupied. She has another renter. He's staying until after Christmas. Michelle had met Chris in passing on the back deck earlier in the day. He seemed like a nice guy, 
and he had helped Miss Doris and her friend Amy organize the annual Palmer Island Christmas Parade. She was sorry she'd missed it by a few days. You had no idea the beach trip was cancelled? Cutry's Martel sounded tired and defeated. I didn't. I wouldn't have flown down here if I knew you weren't going to be here, Dad. Michelle pulled the blanket a little tighter around herself and hugged her knees to her body. I would have sworn, his voice trailed off and she heard him swallow hard. I'm sorry. She heard the sincerity in his voice. It was something, but as usual, it wasn't enough. I've had a couple of crazy busy months. Between the album and tour, I've been going non-stop. You know how it is. She didn't know, but she could imagine. Her father's music career had always been successful, and interest had grown since the release of the band's greatest hits album. It was the reason she hadn't seen him or even heard much from him since April. How long are you going to be in London, she asked. A couple of weeks. We're doing some media after the holidays and start the tour New Year's Day in Wembley Stadium. He sounded excited. I thought your tour didn't start until March. All of this was news to her. We added a few gigs in Europe when the album climbed the charts over here. This meant she wouldn't see him for the rest of the world tour unless she went out to one of his US concerts. I didn't tell you any of this? I know we haven't talked much lately, but I thought for sure we'd gone over the new tour plans. Michelle heard the doubt creeping into her father's voice. We didn't. She didn't know what else to say. Okay. Another long pause. Are you going to be okay? Do you need me to send you some money? I'm fine, Dad. Good. I'm glad. I'll make it up to you, I swear. I have to get a couple of hours sleep. I'll call you tomorrow, Shelley. Michelle grimaced at his use of the nickname she hated. She let him go. There wasn't anything she could do or say to change the fact that he'd dumped her again. It took Michelle a long time to go back to sleep. Chapter 3 Michelle tapped her fingers on the wooden tabletop glancing again at the time on her phone. He was late. She took a sip of coffee. It had turned ice cold. Yuck. What was she still doing here? It was obvious Joel had stood her up. Yet, a small part of her held on to a glimmer of hope. Maybe he was just running late. Very late. She started to toss the phone into her purse and dig around for her keys when Mitch, the owner of the roasted bean, stepped up beside her table, a fresh cup of coffee in hand. You look like you could use this. Waiting for someone? He put the coffee down in front of her and picked up the cold one. Joel, he asked. Michelle nodded. We were supposed to meet for lunch, but I guess he's a no-show. It happens. She shrugged, trying not to show how much it bothered her. Thanks for the coffee, but I have to get going, she said, starting to rise. Mitch sat down across from her. Joel's a good guy. If he said he'd meet you, he has a good reason for not being here. He motioned with his head for her to sit back down. Michelle was torn. She wasn't the kind of girl who sat around waiting for a guy to grace her with his presence. In the end, her curiosity won out, and she sat back in the chair accepting the coffee Mitch pushed closer to her. You know him well, she asked, before taking a cautious sip. Known him since the day he moved down here. He lives pretty close. Mitch looked down at the table and started wiping away at spots Michelle hadn't noticed. That could have been her lack of glasses, or maybe Mitch was just trying to keep his hands busy. How close, she asked, staring right at him. If Joel lived close, she'd know he'd be lying if he told her he'd been stuck in traffic. A couple of miles down the road. His condo is right by the ocean. Mitch got up when a group of women entered the shop. All I'm saying is this isn't like him. Give him a couple more minutes, and enjoy your coffee, okay? Michelle nodded. She could do that. It wasn't like she had anywhere to be. She grabbed her phone. Still no message from Joel. She was tempted to text him, but that would look needy. 
Instead, she opened the Kindle app on her phone and went back to reading the sweet romance she'd started the night before. It was a cute holiday story, and before long, she was lost in it. I'm so sorry. Michelle looked up, surprised to see Joel standing in front of her. His face was red and his breath was coming rapidly. Are you okay? Sit down. She motioned to the chair Mitch had vacated a little while ago. You look like you're about to keel over. Joel nodded. I ran, he got out between big gulps of air. Car wouldn't start. He fell into the chair opposite hers. You ran over here? All the way from the beach? Michelle shook her head and stared at him. Wanted to see you. He was still having trouble catching his breath. A small trickle of sweat ran down the side of his face. He wiped it away with the back of his hand. Mitch appeared from behind the counter, a tall glass of water in hand. He handed it to Joel before turning to Michelle. Told you he'd have a good reason, he said before walking back behind the counter. Michelle laughed, relief flooding through her. Mitch was right. From the looks of it, Joel had done everything he could to make it to their date. She was impressed. Why didn't you text me? I could have come to meet you. Joel had downed most of the water and started to look a little more composed. That's no way to impress a girl. Running was a much better idea. He grinned and she couldn't help but agree. Not that she'd tell him that. Michelle got the feeling that the last thing Joel needed was a boost in confidence. What's wrong with your car, she asked instead. I'm not sure, hopefully it's just the battery. I'm having a friend of mine look at it tonight. Fingers crossed it's an easy and inexpensive fix. He looked a little concerned, the smile on his face starting to wane. Older car? He nodded. It's a 96 Golf. Got it used right out of high school. Did you go to school down here? She asked, curious to learn more about the guy who had just run who knew how far to keep a date with her. No. I moved here almost two years ago. I grew up just outside Raleigh, North Carolina. How about you? Not from around here either, she joked. He rolled his eyes. I moved around a lot as a kid. She hesitated, trying to figure out how to explain without letting anything slip about her unusual upbringing. My dad traveled for work a lot. My mom stayed home with me, so we ended up tagging along most of the time. She glanced up to judge his reaction. He looked interested, but not thrown off by her comment. My grandparents are from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I spent a good bit of time there and ended up going to school at Penn State. What did you go to school for? Joel asked, looking genuinely interested. English and education, she said. I'm a first-year teacher at a middle school back home. That sounds challenging. You can say that again. Nothing like a room full of 12-year-olds with no interest in the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. She shuddered at the memory of that first reading assignment. It hadn't gone well, but she'd learned a lot from the experience. It's a lot of work, and I'm still finding my teaching style, but I'm getting there. It's what I've wanted to do since I was eight. How about you? I wanted to be a firefighter or an astronaut, he quipped. She got the feeling work wasn't something he liked to talk about. You like living down here? she asked. I do. Palmer is a nice place. It's a lot calmer and more laid back than the tourist areas up around Myrtle Beach. He glanced out the window at Main Street. Her eyes followed his, and she took in the row of shops. She liked this place. It had a small town feel to it with a beachy flair. Ready to order lunch? he asked. I'm starving. She could hear his stomach growl from across the table. Sure, what's good? They ordered a couple of sandwiches to share and a bowl of soup each. The food was fresh and delicious. Over the course of the meal, Michelle learned quite a bit about the island, from its history as a seaside retreat for rich plantation owners, to the best places to hang out on the beach or fish in the intercoastal waterway. She was surprised how much there was to do and explore, even in the wintertime. 
If it was half as fun as Joel made it sound, she'd have to plan a trip back down here when the weather warmed up. Would you like a ride back home? she asked after they'd finished eating. That would be great. I'm not sure I can go for a jog after all the food. Joel patted his stomach. Mitch was right. He didn't live far. It took them less than ten minutes to get to his condo. From what she could tell from glancing between the buildings, it was right on the beach. Would you like to come in for a minute? I've got a pretty view, Joel said after she'd pulled into the parking spot next to the old Volkswagen Golf he'd directed her to. Michelle hesitated. She didn't want him to get the wrong idea, but so far, their date had been perfectly nice and innocent. And she was dying to check out the beach and the ocean. Sure, but just for a minute. I have to get back to help Miss Doris make cookies for a bake sale. Joel nodded and led the way. His place was nice, and he hadn't been exaggerating. The view of the Atlantic Ocean was amazing. The entire back wall of the efficiency apartment was made up of glass. A sliding door led out to a small balcony with just enough room for two chairs and a tiny round side table. The apartment itself was basically just one large room with a futon couch, a bistro table and chairs, a kitchenette, and a sparsely filled bookshelf. Everything was bright and very minimalistic. And surprisingly clean for a bachelor pad. This is great, she said gazing across the space. It works for me, and the rent is cheap. Hard to beat the view. Michelle stepped up to the window and looked out at the beach. It is. Unless there's a hurricane coming in. Once those watches go up, I'm out of here, Joel said. She didn't think it would take him long to pack up. He could probably fit everything but the futon in the back of his car. Do you play? she asked, glancing at the acoustic guitar leaning up against the wall next to the bookshelf. She walked over and skimmed his selection of books, CDs, and vinyl albums. He was into his music. She smiled when she saw several of her dad's records among the collection. She'd have to be extra careful not to let anything slip. At least for now. People got weird once they knew whose daughter she was. Joel didn't answer her question. Instead, he picked up his guitar, sat down, and started tuning it. He picked a few strings and finally settled into the beginning of a song. It didn't take her long to recognize Winter Song. It had been her favorite for years. Michelle didn't realize she'd started harmonizing along with him until she caught him looking at her. His eyebrows were raised and a small smile was playing around his lips, but he kept singing, as did she. You have an amazing voice. Joel set the guitar aside and stared at her. Michelle shrugged her shoulders. Thanks, I've always liked that song. Praise about her voice made her uncomfortable. It was usually followed by. Have you thought about singing professionally? You've got the pipes to make it. And there it was. The reason she didn't often sing in public. Or in front of anyone, her dad included. No. It's not really my thing. I just sing because I enjoy it. Mostly around the house and in church every once in a while. Joel nodded and looked like he wanted to say more. She noticed an almost imperceptible shake of his head. He stood. Would you like something to drink? I have a couple of sodas in the fridge. Michelle shook her head. I have to get going. I don't want to leave Miss Doris waiting. It's so kind of her to take me in. What do you mean? I thought you were renting a cottage or something for Christmas break. Oops. She forgot she hadn't told him yet about the rental mix-up. We were. My dad was supposed to meet me down here. He had to cancel the trip and forgot to tell me about it. But what can you do? She shrugged. What? He bailed on you and didn't bother to tell you? Joel looked more upset than she'd felt about the whole thing at the moment. It's no big deal, really. I'm used to it. Well, that's just sad. Joel's expression softened. That means I'm going to have to show you a good time to make up for it. Let's start with dinner. Tomorrow night. 
nothing fancy. I could do that, Michelle replied, unable to suppress a smile. Great. I'll be back from work around nine. Will that work, or is that too late for you? It looked like he was holding his breath. Interesting. He really wanted to have a meal with her. That works. Where do you want to go? I can meet you there. With the state his car was in, she didn't want to risk having him pick her up, even if his friend would be able to fix it. How about Mary's? It's nothing fancy, but they have the best burgers around, Joel said. Burger sounds great. She picked up her purse and started to dig around for her car keys. Maybe we can go see a band after, Joel said. That sounds like fun. It's a date, she replied before she could catch herself. Why did she say that? Way to put pressure on the guy. She warily looked up at him. Joel was grinning from ear to ear. It's a date. This isn't good. Joel ran his fingers through his hair. He'd hoped it was just the battery. Now such luck. I'm pretty sure I have an alternator at the shop, said Kurt. I'll let you have it at cost. Got to help out a fellow musician. Kurt wasn't just a great bass player, he was a whiz when it came to fixing older cars. He worked at his family's car repair shop and played in a band on the weekends. They'd met when Joel was scouting out a potential gig shortly after he'd moved down to the island. Kurt and his band had played at the bar that night, and he'd invited Joel to hang out during their break. They'd been friends ever since. How much is a new alternator going to be? Joel asked, looking at his golf. Not that he had much of a choice. He needed the car to get back and forth to work. About $500. I'll have to check. Kurt leaned back against the hood of the car and wiped his hands on an old rag. Shouldn't take more than a couple of hours to replace. I can have it up and running by this afternoon. Joel nodded. Do it. I have to play a show tonight. Kurt was back with the replacement alternator a few hours later and they got to work. It took a little longer than expected, but they got the car running. Joel rushed up to his place to shower and was on the road in time to make the early evening show. You're late, his boss said when Joel walked in the back door. He nodded and rushed to the locker room to get in costume. Car trouble, he yelled over his shoulder. It's one thing after the other with you lately. Barry was following Joel into the small room lined with lockers, benches, and a few tall mirrors. I'm not going to be able to keep you on if this continues. Joel looked up and saw the older man's face in one of the mirrors. He looked serious. It won't happen again, Joel said. What happened, dude? You were all into this last year, and now I can't shake the feeling that you'd rather not be here. Joel shrugged. He wasn't sure how to reply. The man wasn't wrong, but Joel couldn't come out and tell him that. Not if he wanted to keep his job. The truth was that Joel didn't want to play the show anymore. The problem was that he couldn't afford to lose this job until he got the demo album made. He hoped that would happen on Christmas Day. He smiled. His own Christmas miracle. Of course, that was only the first step. He'd have to get it into the hands of producers. He glanced down at his phone and opened his emails. He read through the message from a friend in New York who'd emailed him about a hot lead. It was his big shot. Joel buttoned his shirt and shrugged on the red velvet jacket. It was much too hot to wear on stage, but it looked Christmassy, and this was showbiz. He forced a smile on his face and turned to his boss. Can't think of anywhere I'd rather be tonight, he lied. That's the spirit. Get out there and spread some Christmas cheer. His boss clapped him on the shoulder and left. Joel took a deep breath, trying not to feel guilty about feigning his enthusiasm. This was a good job, and the people who'd paid to come see them deserved to be entertained. He squared his shoulders and picked up his guitar. He could do this. Just one show, and then he'd get to see Michelle. The thought of the pretty blonde with the bubbly personality and the beautiful voice put a genuine smile on his face. 
It was one of the most fun shows he'd performed in for months. He could tell he was playing and singing better than usual, and there was a different kind of energy flowing around him and the rest of the cast. After the last curtain call, he sprinted back to the locker room. He'd have to hurry to make it back in time for his date. Thanks for covering for me, Russell said when Joel ran into him on his way out the door. No problem. How was the play, he asked. Pretty cute. Ella was adorable as a reindeer. Russell pulled his phone out of his back pocket. Wanna see? Tomorrow, Joel said. I'm late for a date. He couldn't keep the grin off his face. Chapter 4 This better not become a habit, Michelle said jokingly when Joel pulled into the parking lot at Mary's ten minutes late. It won't, he said, and the sincerity in his eyes made Michelle's heart beat faster. Good. Michelle grabbed her purse and locked the rental car. Let's go. I'm starving. The place wasn't fancy, but the food smelled amazing. They were quickly seated in a booth. Where's Cindy? Joel asked when their waitress walked up to take their order. She's off until the first of the year, the young girl said. The name tag on her crisp white shirt read Jenny. Good for her. Joel glanced down at the menu and then up at Michelle. Ready to order? he asked. Michelle nodded and turned to Jenny. Can I have the all-American burger with a side of mac and cheese? Good call, Joel said after the waitress left to put in their order. Mary's mac and cheese is homemade and really good. He'd ordered his own burger with a side of fries. If you're nice, I might let you have a bite. In exchange for a couple of fries, of course. Deal. Joel raised his water glass. She picked up her soda, and they clinked the sturdy glassware together. There wasn't a piece of plastic in sight, aside from the straw the waitress had offered her. Even the salt and pepper were in glass containers. Michelle didn't think it was out of environmental concerns. Mary seemed like the kind of old-fashioned place that continued to run the same way it had for the past 30 or 40 years. That meant porcelain plates, metal silverware, and glasses made from thick glass instead of plastic. Who's Cindy? she asked, remembering his earlier question. One of the waitresses. She usually covers this section. Joel played with his fork, twirling it between his fingers. You come here a lot? Michelle asked. It was a stupid question, and she wished she could take it back. Obviously, he came here frequently if he knew what waitress worked in what section. She could feel the heat rising in her cheeks. This was different. She didn't usually feel this awkward on a date. Once or twice a week, Joel said. They are usually closed by the time I get back from work, or it would be more often. What exactly do you do? Michelle was getting curious about this job of his that had him working late hours. Joel looked down at his hands, fidgeting with the napkin. She got the feeling he was uncomfortable with the question. I work at one of those tourist trap music shows, he finally said. Michelle could hear the alarm bells ringing in the back of her head. Please don't be a musician. She knew he had an amazing voice and played the guitar. But what were the chances he was using his skills to make a living? Most people didn't. Thankfully, their food arrived, and she was able to shove that thought into the back of her mind. Still up for a trade, he asked, holding up a fry before popping it into his mouth. She grinned. I don't know. Let me see if this mac and cheese is as good as you say it is. I might take back the offer. She picked up her fork and scooped a bite of the cheesy, gooey dish. It looked piping hot, like it had just come fresh out of the oven. Michelle blew on it gently and then touched it carefully to her lips to test the temperature. She did not want to burn the roof of her mouth again with melting cheese. She glanced up and saw Joel staring at her intently. His eyes were glued to her mouth and the fork. It sent shivers down her spine, in a good way. She smiled and slowly ate the small bite. MMM, Michelle didn't have to fake the pleasure of eating this simple dish. It was perfection. 
The noodles had just a little bite to them and the flavor was amazing. The sauce was creamy, and the cheese had just enough sharpness to it to keep it interesting. It was the best macaroni and cheese she'd ever eaten. I'm not so sure about that anymore, she said after she swallowed. And here I thought we had a deal. Joel gave her sad puppy eyes. When he made pouty lips, she couldn't keep in the laugh. Okay, I'll cave. You can have a bite. Give me your fork. Michelle took it and scooped a small portion of the cheesy goodness on it. She held the fork out over the table, expecting him to pick it back up. Instead, Joel leaned forward and put his mouth around the tip of the fork. His eyes locked with hers as he savored the bite of food she'd shared with him. She couldn't have looked away if she'd wanted to. Not that she did. Her heart was turning into melted goo looking at him. How had she not noticed the cute dimple in his cheek before? Michelle was fascinated by this handsome man she knew so little about. He had turned what could have been a very sad and lonely Christmas trip into something fun and exciting. Maybe coming down here had been fate. Thanks. This is as good as I remembered, he said a moment later in a deep, husky voice. It sounded rich, like dark, molten chocolate. What was it with the melted food references that kept popping into her head? She needed to get it together if she didn't want to turn into a blubbering idiot. Still stunned, Michelle hadn't realized she still held Joel's fork until he took it from her. The small spark that ran across her hand and arm when his fingers brushed over hers in the process, jolted her out of paralysis. That had been something else. Intimate somehow. Her hand shook from the experience, and she quickly tucked it into her lap. How's your car? she asked to distract herself. And him. He stared at her with an intense look in his eyes that made it hard to get the words out. She put her fork back into the cheesy noodle dish and popped another bite in her mouth. He couldn't expect her to talk while she was eating. Working again, but it was a close call. He lowered his gaze to his plate and picked up his burger before looking back up at her. She cocked her head to the side, hoping he'd get the message. She didn't know what he was talking about and why it was a close call. It needed a new alternator, he said, still holding on to his burger. A little ketchup started to work its way down the bun and onto his pinky. A friend of mine was able to replace it, but it took longer than expected. We barely got it working again before I had to leave for work this afternoon. Michelle nodded. That made sense. That's good, she said, before thinking of a way to keep the conversation going. Where do you work? It's not here on the island, right? she asked. It was a dumb question, but better than silence. She couldn't wait for them to get to know each other well enough that silence became comfortable instead of awkward. She was as outgoing as the next person, but sometimes it was nice to be able to enjoy a few bites of food without the need for conversation. Up in Myrtle Beach. That's why I needed to get the car running again, no matter what. A frown line formed between his beautiful eyes. He seemed worried about something. Michelle replayed the last few moments of their conversation. You didn't expect the expense, she guessed. He nodded, before taking another bite of his burger. Message received. Money wasn't something he wanted to talk about. That was fine with her. The constant struggle of living on her meager teacher salary wasn't her favorite topic of conversation either. At least she knew she could go to her dad if there was ever a dire need. From what she'd learned of Joel Fisher, so far, he didn't have that luxury. I've spent the day baking with Miss Doris, she blurted. She felt her cheeks warming. What was it about him that turned her into a chatty Kathy? She took a sip of her soda and a deep breath. I've been trying to help out around the place since she was kind enough to let me stay in the spare room. She leaned back in her seat, resisting the urge to cross her arms across her chest. She needed to calm down or this date would turn into a disaster. She's a great baker from what I hear, Joel said, nodding his head. Mitch has been trying to get her to bake for his coffee shop for years. She won't do it. He took another big bite of his burger. I think she mostly bakes for charity, Michelle said. 
we've been making cookies and pies for the church bake sale. She took a small bite of her burger. Have you had one of her apple pies? Joel shook his head. You should stop by the bake sale on Sunday. They'll have it set up in front of the church after the 10 o'clock service. You could pick up one of the smaller pies. She glanced at him, noticing doubt in his eyes. It's for a good cause, she said. The women's prayer circle uses the funds from the bake sale to buy toys for kids in town who wouldn't have anything under the tree otherwise. Joel took a sip of his drink. He looked thoughtful as he leaned in. That's a great cause, he said, his voice rough and tinged with something she couldn't make out. I'll stop by and buy a few. He grew silent for a moment before clearing his throat. There were years when gifts like those were the only ones my sister and I got on Christmas. His eyes were turned down to the table, and he started to fidget with his napkin. Michelle got the feeling it wasn't something he admitted often. I'm glad, she said. Every child should have a present to open on Christmas morning. She smiled, hoping he would pick up on the sincerity in her words. We went through some lean years, and those gifts made a big difference. The expression on his face changed from somber to hopeful, even joyful. It was hard to tell, but Michelle got the impression that he was recalling happier memories. That's how I got my first guitar. The kindness of those church ladies started my love for music. Michelle could tell how much it had meant to him. How much it still meant. She could picture a young Joel sitting on the couch on Christmas Day, plucking away on the strings of an inexpensive toy guitar. It made her smile. She was glad music had brought him joy, and she wished she didn't have such a love-hate relationship with it herself. She loved to sing and enjoyed listening to a good song as much as anyone, but she'd also seen the dark side of the music industry. She'd experienced firsthand how much it could cost the artist and their loved ones. She shook her head. This train of thought wasn't getting her anywhere, and it wasn't appropriate for a first date. That's what this was. A first real date with Joel, and so far things were going pretty well. She liked him and hoped the feeling was mutual. The rest of the dinner went by quickly. They chatted about music and cars and crappy jobs they'd had in the past. Joel still didn't seem to want to talk about his current one, but she shared freely the challenges she faced as a young teacher. Joel had plenty of stories ready about what he'd done as a student. She cringed at some of the stunts he'd pulled to get out of class and the excuses he'd used when he hadn't done his homework. If nothing else, this part of the conversation prepared her for the excuses she was sure to hear once the school year started back up. Any dessert? Jenny asked when she came back to clear their plates. Joel looked at Michelle expectantly, but she shook her head. As much as she'd like to prolong the date, she couldn't fit another bite. Maybe next time. I'm too full. Michelle patted her stomach. The food had been good and the portions large. She'd eaten every last bite and a few of Joel's fries. You don't know what you're missing, Jenny said. Our peanut butter pie is pretty amazing. It is, Joel agreed. He turned to the waitress. We'll get some next time. Just the check, please. He smiled big and Michelle was pretty sure Jenny swooned a little. He seemed to have that effect on people around him. Good thing she wasn't feeling jealous or possessive, much. Are you ready to get out of here? Joel asked after he'd paid and tipped the waitress handsomely. That won him a few extra points in Michelle's book. She'd paid part of her way through college waiting tables and couldn't stand people who were stingy when it came to rewarding their server. She nodded and grabbed her bag, taking one last sip of her soda as she rose. He pulled her to the back of the main dining room and down a small hallway. Michelle noticed an entrance to the kitchen on one side and restrooms on the other. The main door led out to a small patio. I thought we could take the long way back to the cars. There's a boardwalk right along the river. He pointed to a well-lit path that led down to what she assumed was the intercoastal waterway. You don't mind, do you? he asked. I wasn't quite ready to call this date over. He shrugged and looked uncertain. 
A little fresh air sounds great, Michelle responded. She hoped he'd pick up on her encouraging tone. She wasn't ready for the night to end either. It's a beautiful night. He nodded and grabbed her hand, leading her down the stone path toward the river. The moon was shining brightly, and the air was surprisingly warm for a December night. She could smell the tangy air blowing in off the ocean and hear the wind rustling the leaves of the trees lining the path. It didn't take them long to get down to the main boardwalk. Joel still held her hand, and she could feel his warmth spreading through her hand and up her arm. It felt nice. It was calming and exciting all at the same time. They strolled side by side with the light of the full moon glimmering in the water. She didn't see a single other person on the walkway and didn't mind. She'd come to trust Joel, she realized, and felt safe in his company. The old-fashioned street lamps that lined the walkway helped as well. All too quickly, the parking lot came into view. They both slowed their steps, she noticed. But no matter how slowly they walked, it didn't take long before they reached her car. She gently pulled her hand from Joel's to dig in her purse for her car keys. She missed the physical connection the moment she let go. Her hands were shaking, and it took much longer than it should have to locate her set of keys. She took a steadying breath before pushing the button to unlock the car. Michelle turned and leaned back against the side of her car. Thank you, she said, her voice a little breathy. I enjoyed dinner. I did too. Joel stepped forward, closing the distance between them. We should do it again sometime. He reached up and pushed a strand of her hair behind her ear. His hand lingered there for a moment, before he started stroking the back of her hair. Soft, he mumbled, his head slowly lowering. Michelle's breath caught in the back of her throat and her eyes fluttered shut. She could feel the warmth of his hand again as he cradled the back of her head. His breath washed over her, and she heard her own heart beating fast and loud in her ears. Her lips parted a moment before his brushed over them. It was a quick, shy movement, hardly a kiss. It felt more like a question, a request. She opened her eyes and saw him staring at her intently. He held his face less than an inch from hers, waiting, giving her the option to back out of the goodnight kiss. Michelle was having none of it. She couldn't think of anything she wanted more in this moment than to kiss Joel. She reached up and ran her fingers through his hair before pulling him down for a kiss. And what a kiss it was. The man had game. It started slow, nothing more than the brief connection of their lips that taught her how hard and smooth his lips were, and left her wanting for more. A sweet little kiss that quickly turned passionate. By the time they broke apart, they were both breathless. Wow. That was something else, she said, too stunned to come up with anything clever. Glad you enjoyed it. He smiled before kissing the top of her head. I know I did, he murmured into her hair. She wrapped her arms around his waist, wanting him close. He leaned his forehead against hers and as they stood there, time became a meaningless concept. All that mattered was the two of them, together. I'm not ready for tonight to end, he said softly a few minutes later. Would you like to go have a drink and listen to some music? I would. She nodded. Joel pushed away from her and her car. I know a little bar down the road. I'm not sure who's playing tonight, but it's usually pretty good. He looked at her, waiting for an answer. Still shaken from the kiss, she nodded and realized she still had her car keys in her hand. She pushed the button and heard the clicking noises that told her the car doors were locked again. Do you mind driving? Instead of an answer, he grabbed her hand and led her to his car, parked a row over. He escorted her to the passenger side door and opened it for her, waiting for Michelle to get settled in before closing it and making his way to the other side. A big grin lit up his face as he climbed in and started the engine. You're going to love this. That kiss. Joel couldn't stop thinking about the kiss he'd shared with Michelle a few minutes before. He couldn't get it out of his head and had to force himself to focus on the road in front of him. There was no way he could have watched her drive off after a kiss like that. 
It had started off slow, and then she'd grabbed his head, deepened the kiss, and they'd become lost. His heart beat faster, just thinking about it. He shook his head and tried to think of something to talk about. The silence in the car was thick, but surprisingly not uncomfortable. Music, he asked before turning the radio to his favorite station, to fill the silence. He looked at the bar just outside of Palmer Island, with different eyes, now that Michelle was by his side. It was a bit of a dive, and he noticed her curious glance around the dark and dingy place. Maybe this hadn't been the best choice for a first date. When the band started to play, he noticed a smile playing around Michelle's lips. She was mumbling the words to the popular country song as they walked past the bar, farther into the main room. He picked a small table towards the back. It was far enough from the stage that they could talk over the sound of the band, but close enough to see and enjoy the live performance. Can I get you something to drink? Joel asked before walking to the bar to pick up a couple of beers. He set them on the table and pulled out the chair across from her. The band is good, she said, fidgeting with her bottle and taking a cautious sip of the bitter brew. Joel nodded. They've played together for close to a decade, I think. Michelle turned to look at the group of middle-aged men on stage. Joel wondered what she thought about the local band. He'd gotten to know them over the years, playing many of the same clubs and bars across the greater Myrtle Beach area. You know them? she asked. Joel nodded. Chad's playing lead guitar and sings most of their songs. Brandon is the bass player, and that's Toby on the keyboard. Ray's behind the drums. She nodded. Nice drum set. It was, and it was Ray's pride and joy. He was surprised she'd noticed though. Maybe she knew more about the music business than she'd let on. Judging a professional drum set wasn't exactly an everyday skill. What kind of music do you like, he asked, curious about what she had to say. A little bit of everything, I guess. Michelle shrugged her shoulders. He wasn't going to let her get away with a non-answer like that. He leaned back, raised his eyebrows, and took a sip of his beer. She'd barely touched hers, he noticed. Michelle was quiet for a moment, fidgeting with her bottle and starting to pull the label off. I grew up with all the classics. My dad played a bunch of Motown, Elvis, Beatles. I can't remember not having music playing. I mostly liked whatever was popular at the time, and don't hold it against me, but for a while there I got into a Justin Bieber phase. Her cheeks turned an interesting shade of red at the admission. Joel feigned disappointment and shook his head, before flashing her a smile and a wink to let her know he was joking. Don't feel bad. I have a couple of Taylor Swift albums hidden in a box somewhere. There's a time and place for just about any kind of music, he said, and he meant it. One of his favorite things about playing a place like the Sinking Goat Bar and Grill was being able to read the room and adjust his playlist to come up with something that worked for that night's audience. Music was a powerful thing that could make you feel better in an instant, or allow you to wallow in sadness for a while if that's what you needed to do. Music changed his life, saved it really, and he'd made it his mission to touch the lives of as many people as possible. Getting a record deal would help him do that on a much larger scale. They chatted about music, and from there, the conversation quickly turned to movie scores and then favorite movies and books. It was incredibly easy to talk to Michelle, and while they didn't agree on everything, many of their tastes were similar. Joel finished his beer and glanced over at hers. It was still mostly full. Can I get you something else? he asked. Actually, yes. She smiled at him. Beer isn't really my thing. You don't say? I know this is going to sound completely ridiculous, but do you think they'd make me a Shirley Temple? Only one way to find out, Joel said as he stood. I'll be right back. He grabbed the two bottles and headed to the bar. Can I get a beer? and do you make a Shirley Temple?" he asked the bartender. The guy was new, and Joel wasn't sure how he'd take the request. Thankfully, his order didn't seem to pose a problem. He felt a hand on his shoulder, before he heard Chad's voice close to his ear. 
Only then did he realize that the band had taken a break and music was blaring through the speakers next to the bar. Who thought that was a smart idea? Playing later? Chad asked after taking the beer the bartender handed him. Joel shook his head. Not tonight. I'm here with a date. He leaned his head toward the back of the bar and the table where Michelle was sitting, playing with her phone. He hoped the bartender would hurry and fix the kitty drink she'd requested. She's cute. Good luck. Chad grabbed the beers for his bandmates and worked his way back to the stage. A few minutes later, Joel was back and set Michelle's drink in front of her. It was a fizzy, bright red concoction with a cherry floating on the top. It smelled sweet and reminded him of some candy he'd liked as a kid. Thanks, I've loved these since I was a little girl. Michelle took a sip and sighed happily. My dad's a, she stopped. My dad's boss used to order them for me at, hmm, company functions. She looked down at her drink and played with the straw. It was the best part of having to hang out all night. Joel could tell there was more to this story. Good times, he asked cautiously. Some of it. To be honest, most of it was pretty boring. She grabbed the cherry and popped it into her mouth. Let's talk about something else. Do you hang out here a lot? He shrugged his shoulders. Every once in a while. No need to tell her he sang and played here at least a few nights each month. We're back, and we have a special guest joining us tonight, he heard Chad say over the microphone. A shiver ran down his back. He had a pretty good idea of what was coming next and he wasn't sure how Michelle would take it. Joel, why don't you come up and join us for a couple of songs? Joel looked over at Michelle. Her face looked frozen. Do you mind? he asked. She shrugged her shoulders. Chad called him out again, telling him to get his butt on stage. Joel figured the quickest way to stop him was to go up, perform a song or two, and then come back and figure out what Michelle's reaction was all about. She'd known he played and sang. They'd performed together in his apartment. Joel couldn't keep his eyes off Michelle as he sang. Thankfully Chad knew him well and picked two songs he could play by heart. The two of them took turns singing the lyrics, and the rest of the band did a great job harmonizing the backup vocals. By the end of the first song, Michelle's face started to relax and her smile returned. The second song was more upbeat, and he could see her getting into it, practically dancing in her seat. By the time he made it back to their table, he was keyed up and in performer mode. There was something about being up on stage. He could feel the energy of the room flow into him. He knew he was grinning ear to ear. You're pretty good, she said when he took his seat across from her. She was smiling, but somehow Joel got the feeling that it wasn't the same as before. They chatted for a while and after another couple of songs, the band took another break. The guys walked over and pushed an empty table next to theirs. It was nice to have them there to keep the conversation going. Michelle was polite and joined in when asked, but overall, she seemed quiet and withdrawn. Joel wished he knew what was going on. The only thing he'd done was get up on stage and she seemed to like his voice. She'd told him so. He had no idea what the problem was. By the time the band went back to play another set, Michelle had grown even quieter, and he'd noticed her hiding quite a few yawns. Ready to get out of here? he asked. She nodded and took the last sip of her Shirley Temple. She was just as quiet on the drive home. They talked a little about their evening, the performance, and she thanked him for a nice night out. Joel walked her to her car and bent down for another kiss. It was different from the last one. A night and a kind of difference. She'd been all in with passion before their visit to the bar. This felt different. More distant, and like she was holding back. Maybe she was just tired. At least that's what he told himself as he watched her drive off. Chapter 5. I don't want to hear it, Mom. Michelle glanced around the room, her cell phone pressed to her ear. She needed something to distract her, or better, something to give her an excuse to end this conversation with her mother. 
Where was Miss Doris when she needed her? Shouldn't she come check on her guest and baking assistant? I knew something like this was going to happen. But really. To forget about you and leave you stranded at Christmas. What was the man thinking? Not that I'm surprised. I can't tell you how many times he left me high and dry in our twelve years of marriage, her mother rambled on and on about what a horrible husband and father her dad had been. She had a point, but that didn't make it any easier to listen to. Especially since it was the hundredth time her mother had launched into this particular rant. Mom, I know, and I'm not really surprised. Just disappointed. Michelle had to bring this conversation to an end before she started to pull her hair out and before her mother worked herself into a frenzy. Where are you now? her mother asked. I was able to rent a room down here at the beach. I fly back home after Christmas. You're down there all by yourself? Her mother's voice took on a worried tone. At least it was an improvement from the ranting and raving. Not how she'd wanted to start what looked to be a perfectly lovely Saturday, but what could you do? She'd known better than to ignore a call from her mom. Yes, I'm here by myself. I'm kind of stuck with the plane ticket and all. Michelle shrugged even though she knew her mother couldn't see her. Which was probably a good thing. She wouldn't be a fan of the small bedroom Michelle had rented from Miss Doris. If the older lady let her pay her for her kindness. Michelle still wasn't sure that would happen. The other end of the line had gone quiet. She could hear her mother's fingers tapping on something in the background. Her mother cleared her throat. Why don't you come up here for Christmas, she asked. I can have Don send you a ticket and you could spend the holidays with us. The boys would love to see their big sister. Michelle doubted that. Her half-brothers barely knew her, and while she knew her stepfather would buy the ticket, it would be a stretch for them financially, and there was no way her mom would ask her father to foot the bill. Although they would welcome her, she'd feel like a fifth wheel the entire time. They were a family. She was the grown daughter from a failed first marriage. Thanks for the offer, Mom. Michelle thought about how to let her down easy. But I've already made plans here. I have people relying on me, like Miss Doris. I promised to help with the church bake sale and with Christmas dinner. Michelle could hear her mother chuckle on the other end of the line. That's my girl. Making friends anywhere you go. You've always been good at that, you know. When we were on tour with your dad, it hadn't taken you five minutes in a new town before you'd made a friend. Michelle nodded. She remembered those days. She also remembered the heartbreak each time they left. Making new friends everywhere you went was great. Turning around and leaving them just when you'd started to like each other wasn't. Anyway, she continued. I really appreciate the invitation, but I think I'll stay down here. And who knows, maybe dad will show after all. Don't count on that, honey, her mother said. If you change your mind, give me a call. You're always welcome here. Her voice was full of warmth and sincerity. Michelle knew her mother meant it, even if a visit from her would complicate things. Thanks, mom. Maybe next year. That sounds good. Next year it is. Michelle could hear the relief her mother was no doubt feeling and swallowed hard. Her mother had found Dawn and moved on. She'd started a second family, one that Michelle wasn't really a part of, no matter what her mother said out loud. I'm sorry, I have to run. The twins are trying to flood the bathroom. Call me later in the week? Her mother had hung up the phone before Michelle could respond. Part of her knew her five little brothers were a handful and needed most of their mother's attention, but it still stung to always play second fiddle. She tossed her phone on the end of the bed and curled into a ball, clutching one of the decorative pillows to her chest. She thought back to the days when they'd been a family. Before she'd started school, Michelle and her mother had traveled with her dad and his band. She'd been all over the world, and while that sounded fun and glamorous, it had also been exhausting, tedious, and often pretty boring. Riding eight hours on a bus to get to the next location quickly lost its novelty and appeal. 
She sighed and made herself get up. Michelle walked into the small attached bathroom and washed her face. Looking in the mirror, she forced herself to cheer up. Wallowing in self-pity never helped anyone. She had things to do and much to look forward to. Michelle heard Miss Doris working in the kitchen and she'd promised to help bake more pies along with a few batches of muffins, scones, and cookies today. She didn't have time to agonize about the past or the fact that Joel was a musician. That was a problem for another day. It was a crisp and sunny morning when Michelle met Joel at the Palmer Island Christmas Market. This is impressive, and very festive. Michelle looked around at the booths and rides that were just starting to open up. Joel had asked her to meet him there half an hour before the market officially opened. Not a lot of people were moving around yet, and those she saw were busy getting set up. She smelled kettle corn popping and the first few waffles baking as they walked towards a small white trailer with a big mug painted on the side. Hot chocolate? Joel asked as they approached the counter. To her surprise, Mitch from the coffee shop where they'd first met was running the stand. She nodded. It was cooler than she'd expected and she had left her gloves in the dresser in her room at Miss Doris's. She hadn't thought she'd need them down here. A cup of hot chocolate would work great to warm them back up. And who was she kidding? She loved hot chocolate and had already spied a young woman setting up a toppings table, stocking it with things like whipped cream, sprinkles, and candy canes. She looked at Joel across the condiment table. He patiently waited for her to finish while sipping his own drink. She shook her head. He'd added nothing but a sprinkle of cinnamon to his hot chocolate. That was crazy, considering all the fun add-ons and toppings to choose from. She made a mental note to set something like this up for her classroom next year on the day before Christmas break. The kids would love it, and it couldn't be any messier than building gingerbread houses, as they'd done this year. What are you smiling about? she asked when she caught him watching her plop a few marshmallows into her cup, before adding a big dollop of whipped cream to the top. I like watching you enjoying yourself. Joel's grin widened. You're really getting into this. If it's there, might as well make the most of it. She picked up the container of cocoa powder and dusted the whipped cream topping with it before adding a large red and white striped candy cane to her cup. Perfection. He laughed before grabbing her hand. Let's go. I have a couple of fun surprises lined up for us. Michelle cocked her head to the side before following him through the main thoroughfare towards the carousel that had caught her eye the moment she'd arrived at the fairgrounds. It was large and must have been built close to a hundred years ago. She wouldn't have thought they'd make anything this elaborate and decorative anymore. There were mirrors and lights everywhere, along with hand-painted panels depicting fairy tale scenes and ancient myths. The rides themselves were various animals from common horses to lions, elephants, and even a pair of ostriches. Some of them pulled elaborate carriages that any princess would have been proud to ride in. The carousel was lit up, but it wasn't moving, and there was no music playing. Michelle felt a twinge of disappointment that the ride still seemed to be closed. Maybe they could come back later and go for a ride. There you are, an old man in a worn-out flannel shirt and faded jeans stepped out of the booth. Ready for a private ride? Joel nodded his thanks before ushering Michelle up on the carousel. Take your pick, he said, waving his hand toward the various animals and carriages. Michelle was speechless. She walked around the round platform, taking a look at each and every one of them. It was too much fun, and too hard to choose. In the end, she climbed on the back of one of the circus horses with a fancy mane and bells dangling from the reins. Joel chose the darker horse next to hers, and the music started to play. It was magical. The ride wasn't too fast, and she enjoyed watching the rest of the Christmas fair pass by as she sipped her hot chocolate and listened to the Christmas music blaring from the speakers overhead. That was fun, she beamed as she climbed down a few minutes later. I don't think I've ever had a solo carousel ride. Thank you. She kissed Joel's cheek before they stepped off the platform. 
She waved her thanks to the operator who had stepped back into his small booth. By then, people had started to trickle in, and many of the stands were open for business. He had timed it perfectly. I have another surprise for you, he said with a smile that looked a little too innocent. It's going to take me a little while to set up though. He stopped and hesitated for a moment. Mitch is a little short-staffed today. One of his regulars called in sick, and I was hoping you wouldn't mind helping him finish setting up and restocking the condiments while I get ready? Of course. Michelle liked Mitch and wouldn't mind helping out for a bit, especially if there was more hot chocolate in it for her. She headed to the small trailer as soon as Joel walked off. She had no idea what he was planning. Mitch was probably in on it, and she was confident she could get him to spill the beans. Mitch wasn't as cooperative as she'd hoped, and he needed surprisingly little help. The man was an organizational genius and a pro at multitasking. Michelle handed out cups of hot cocoa and kept an eye on the condiment table, refilling the small containers as needed and picking up spilled candy on and around the table. Time flew, and it wasn't long before Mitch told her to walk up towards the large Christmas tree at the center of the fair. As she got closer, she heard guitar music and then the first few lines of White Christmas. Michelle stopped in her tracks. She recognized that voice. It was Joel. Joel was performing at the Palmer Island Christmas Market. That was the surprise he'd set up for. She shook her head to clear it, and then made her way toward the small stage that was set up close to the main Christmas tree. She wasn't the only one drawn in by his voice. A crowd gathered around her as he played one Christmas song after the other. It hadn't taken him long to find her among the other spectators, and ever since, his eyes returned to her again and again. Michelle was torn. On the one hand, she had sworn to herself she would never date a musician, on the other hand, she couldn't keep her eyes off Joel. She liked the guy, despite the fact that he was a natural-born performer. He was in his element on the stage. Two nights ago, at the bar, she'd seen little glimpses of it, but this was a whole different ball game. He captivated his audience and evoked memories and emotions with nothing more than his voice, his acoustic guitar, and a microphone. Was that what drew her father to taking gig after gig even though he had plenty of money in the bank and enough platinum records hanging in his home office to claim bragging rights in any conversation about music? It had been years since she'd gone to see him and his band perform. Watching Joel play to the crowd and thrive on the energy and love they sent back to him was an eye-opening experience. She let go of some of the resentment she felt for her dad and for Joel, for not being more open about what he did. She lost herself in the music. By the time he'd gotten around to his own version of All I Want for Christmas, she was sure he was singing just to her, and she couldn't have kept the grin off her face if she'd wanted to. Of course, the fact that his eyes were glued to hers didn't keep the girls and women all around her from swooning over the handsome man with the golden voice. Michelle wondered if she should feel jealous, but it was obvious to her, and any impartial observer, that he was performing for her and her alone. It gave her a feeling of confidence and security she hadn't known in any of her previous relationships. Time for a quick break, Joel finally announced before jumping off the stage, guitar in hand. I'll be back in 45 minutes. They walked hand in hand back to Mitch's hot chocolate stand, and Joel left the instrument with his friend for safekeeping. Would you like to take another stroll across the market, now that everything is open? he asked. She nodded as her stomach grumbled at the smell of fresh waffles and funnel cakes baking and brats cooking on electric grills. Let's grab some lunch before you get back on stage, she suggested before dragging him over to one of the food trucks that offered a variety of different tacos and burritos. They placed their orders and took a seat at one of the wooden picnic tables set up between the various food vendors and trucks. It reminded her of one of the food truck festivals she'd been to that summer while visiting a friend out in Colorado. They chatted while they ate their chicken and rice burritos. You're not going to be too full to perform? Michelle asked, thinking about her dad's tendency to skip meals before he went on stage. Nope, this worked out perfectly, and I needed something solid after all that sugar in the hot chocolate earlier. He grew quiet and looked at her. 
Not a lot of people would think about that. He stopped and looked at her expectantly. It was as good a time as any to fess up about her complicated family history. Better to get it out and judge his reaction to her famous dad. If things got weird, and she expected they would, she'd rather know about it before they got any more involved than they already were. My dad's a musician. He's played all over the world and doesn't usually eat until after his gigs. He says the hunger keeps him sharp. Though, she'd always suspected it was partly nerves, and he didn't want to risk throwing up right before a show. Joel nodded. That explains it. What kind of music? Here we go. Classic rock. He's been in a band for decades. You may have heard of them. Wild Horse. My dad's the drummer. Shut up. Wild Horse? Your dad is Curtis Martel? Joel had put down the last chunk of his burrito and stared at her open-mouthed. Yep. The one and only. And the guy who had stood her up, yet again, for a chance to play a gig in London of all places. Wow. He's a legend in the biz. Joel closed his mouth with obvious effort. What's it like, having him as a dad? That was the part of the conversation where she'd usually dive into a couple of harmless white lies about how fun it was to travel around and see the world, hang out with other famous musicians and actors. People loved to hear those kinds of stories, and while there was some truth to them, they weren't the part that counted most. On a whim, she decided to tell Joel the truth. She wanted him to see her and get to know the real her, not just the pretty girl with the famous dad. Honestly, it wasn't all that fun most of the time. She looked up, gauging his reaction to what she was about to share. Being on the road isn't all that glamorous, surely Temple drinks aside. Her lips quirked into a small smile. Lots of travel and waiting around. After a while, the hotel rooms all look the same, and even room service gets old. He nodded. And you're not the biggest fan of musicians, right? He'd been paying attention. That was a good start. He looked thoughtful as he stood and picked up their food wrappers to throw them into one of the large trash cans sitting off to the side. I'm not. I don't date them as a rule. You were sort of an accident. She grinned up at him to soften the blow. I didn't realize you played gigs until today. She cocked her head to the side. Well, I guess I suspected it the other night. I guess it's time I put all my cards on the table, he said as they started to stroll back to Mitch's cart. I am a musician, full time. He stopped and looked at her. I work at the Carolina Theater. That's the day job I've been telling you about, up in Myrtle Beach. Okay. It was a bit of a surprise. Music was more than a side hustle for him. She thought about it for a moment and found that she was fine with the idea of Joel working in the music industry. That was interesting and very different from what she'd felt when she'd met other musicians in the past. It helped that while he was a singer and musician, it felt more like a regular job with set hours and hopefully a good benefit plan. And that's not all of it. He stopped, and she held her breath. Could it get worse? The guy she liked worked as a musician, but at least he wasn't touring. That was a plus. I'm getting ready to record a demo. The end goal is to have an album out and go on tour. He took her hand, and it felt like an attempt to keep her from running off which was something she definitely considered. She liked him, but the idea of dating a touring musician could be a game-changer. Curtis Martel, huh, he mumbled under his breath as they continued to walk across the fairgrounds. She wondered what he was thinking. Chapter 6 The alarm on Michelle's phone went off early on Sunday morning. She was tempted to turn it off and roll over. She'd tossed and turned for hours the night before, thinking back on her conversation with Joel at the Christmas market. The early morning wake-up call had come much too soon. It was pitch black outside and entirely too early to climb out of her warm and comfortable bed. But she'd promised Miss Doris to help bake a few more goodies before heading to the church to set up for the annual charity bake sale. And it was a promise she intended to keep, 
no matter how tempting it was to sleep in. Michelle walked bleary-eyed into the kitchen. Without a word, Miss Doris handed her a big cup of coffee. Michelle took a cautious sip. It was sweet and had plenty of milk, just the way she liked it. She thanked the kind older woman before sitting down at the kitchen table. Miss Doris wasn't wasting any time. Her apron was already covered in flour, and a variety of bowls and baking sheets were strewn across every available surface. Miss Doris returned to rolling out what looked like cookie dough. Michelle took a big gulp of coffee before she got up to grab one of the aprons from the hook in the pantry. What can I do to help, she asked. Thirty minutes later, they were both busy making scones and chocolate chip cookies. The kitchen heated up quickly as the oven ran non-stop and the warm baked goods sat on the counter to cool. Miss Doris's grandniece Sarah stopped by for a little while to help. Miss Doris put her to work wrapping the homemade goodies in cellophane bags while she sat at the table. At almost nine months pregnant, standing for long stretches of time must have been difficult for the young woman. I'm so sorry I won't be able to help you sell these at church, Sarah said as she started to pile everything they'd baked into one of Miss Doris's large picnic baskets. Don't you worry about it. There'll be plenty of other people around. I'm sure I'll manage. Miss Doris waved her off and continued to bustle around the kitchen. Michelle was amazed at her energy. She was hard to keep up with. I can come with you, Michelle offered. It would be a way to return the woman's kindness, and she'd already planned to attend church and buy a few things at the sale. This would simply mean hanging out a little longer to help out. It wasn't like she had any plans for the rest of the day. The bake sale turned out to be a big hit. Michelle was surprised at the number of people gathered around the simple fold-out table that held Miss Doris's treats. At this rate, we'll be done before lunch, Miss Doris said as she wrapped up another one of her pies for a happy customer. Didn't you say Joel was stopping by? Michelle nodded and looked around the large parish hall. So far, there hadn't been a sign of him. Her phone screen was blank, no new texts about car issues or anything like that. You two have been spending quite a bit of time together lately. Miss Doris had kept up a steady stream of chatter since they'd arrived an hour before the 10 o'clock service to set up. Is it getting serious? She asked before adding, you don't have to answer that, unless you want to. The look she shot up at Michelle made it obvious she was dying to learn more about her relationship with the guy who turned out to be a musician. A professional one at that. Honestly, I'm not sure. We were, and I like him, but, Michelle stopped. She was about to say it out loud. That she had misgivings about Joel, because of his music, his passion. It sounded ridiculous, but she couldn't help feeling the way she did, could she? But what? Miss Doris wasn't going to let this go. Michelle smiled. Maybe talking about it would help. There was a brief lull in customers, so she dove in. I like him, but I have this rule. Miss Doris raised her eyebrows in question. I don't date musicians. I've seen what it did to my dad and my family. He was always on the road, groupies trying to get his attention. A lot goes on when you're on the road that doesn't align with what I'm looking for in a partnership or a marriage. Miss Doris nodded. I can see that. I wonder though, does it have to be that way? And does every musician live that way? It was an interesting question, and something Michelle pondered as it got busier. Pies, cookies, and scones flew off the shelves. Well, technically, the table. The point was they were selling, and not a lot were left. Joel had better hurry if he was serious about buying some of them. She'd received a text last night and told him what she was up to today. He'd promised to stop by and support the cause. Looks like I made it just in time. She heard his voice behind her a few minutes later. She felt a quick kiss on her cheek before she turned around to stare into his stunning blue eyes. His bright white teeth flashed underneath his grin, and the butterflies in her stomach took off. She felt like a teenager crushing hard on the class heartthrob. Michelle grabbed a corner of the table to steady herself. What can I get you? 
what did you make, he shot back. Michelle pointed to a batch of cranberry walnut scones and the last of the cherry pies. Hmm, hard choice. How about two of the scones and the pie? That'll be $14, Miss Doris piped up, holding out a hand for the cash. He laughed and handed her a $20 bill. Keep the change, he said. It's for a good cause. That it is. Thank you, young man. Michelle, why don't you walk him back to his car? You look like you could use a little break. Are you sure? Michelle looked around. The crowd had started to die down, and there wasn't a lot left to sell. Miss Doris nodded and shooed her out from behind the table. I'll be back to help you clean up, Michelle promised, before heading out. The fresh air felt good after she'd spent a few hours in the busy parish hall. It's nice of you to help her, Joel said as they strolled across the church parking lot toward his car. He'd parked in the far back, giving them a little extra time together. It's not a big deal, and it's the least I can do, for Miss Doris. It has actually been a lot of fun. Michelle smiled up at him, feeling better now that she'd had a chance to stretch her legs. Anything planned for today? I'm heading over to Mitch's place. I promised to play in the coffee shop for a while. He looked back toward the church. I'm not sure how busy it will be though. Looks like everyone got their sugar fix down here today. Joel took his phone from his pocket and glanced at the time. You have to go. It wasn't a question. She could tell he was running late. Thanks for stopping by and buying some goodies. After a hug that was much too brief and a quick kiss, she headed back inside to help Miss Doris and the rest of the church ladies clean up and tally the donations. As she put away tables and chairs and swept the floors, Michelle thought about a possible future with Joel. What would she do if things worked out between the two of them? Could they even make it work with her teaching in Pennsylvania and him working in South Carolina? And, who knew where he would end up if he got a record deal? It wasn't like he had a lot of strong ties to Palmer Island. Michelle stopped, and her breath caught in the back of her throat. If they gave this relationship a serious shot, not that it was something they'd talked about or even hinted at yet, she would have to tell her mom about him. And she'd have to introduce him to her dad sooner or later. Neither of those would be very pleasant. She could hear her mother now. Throughout the years, she'd made it more than clear that the last thing she wanted for her daughter was a relationship with a musician. Her mother's stories from the road were the biggest reasons Michelle had come up with her dating rule in the first place. Looking at it with new eyes, she'd started to wonder if it was a decision she should revisit. That still left her dad. He would give Joel such a hard time. She wondered if there was a chance the two men would get along. They did have their love for music in common. That might change things. It could also change the dynamic of her relationship with Joel now that he knew who her father was. Penny for your thoughts, Miss Dora said when she walked up to Michelle, a dustpan in hand. They finished sweeping while Michelle shared her worries. It felt good to talk about them, and Miss Doris turned out to be an excellent listener. She didn't judge or interrupt. She was there, in the moment, nodding encouragingly and asking brief, clarifying questions. I understand your worry, she finally said when Michelle finished. Michelle grabbed two of the baskets they had used to carry in the baked goods. Miss Doris did the same, and the two of them strolled out to Michelle's car. I think it's smart of you to consider if you want to seriously date Joel now that you know what he does for a living. Especially, since all this music stuff had such a big impact on your childhood. Miss Doris put her baskets in the backseat of Michelle's car. And I think it still does, especially when it comes to your father. Am I right? Michelle nodded. The music business defined much of the relationship she had with her dad to this day. Heck, it was the reason he'd abandoned her during Christmas. Did she really want to risk getting any deeper into a relationship with someone who might do the same thing? Who would take off and leave her alone at home with their kids to chase the next record deal or play the next big gig? Maybe she should cut her losses, move on, and find a nice accountant to date. 
I think you're right, she said, stepping up to hold the door open for Miss Doris. It isn't like this is going anywhere. We're too different, and we live in different parts of the country. That's not what I'm saying at all, honey. You're misunderstanding. Miss Dora stopped and pulled Michelle off to the side where a few comfortable chairs and a small table sat in front of a large window overlooking a small courtyard and butterfly garden. Michelle wondered who'd created it. Probably some church youth group. Take a seat for a minute. Miss Doris pointed to one of the chairs and took a seat herself. It's nice to get off my feet, she sighed happily. Michelle felt bad that she hadn't considered Doris should have sat down for breaks throughout the morning. I'm confused, Michelle admitted after she'd made herself comfortable in a large leather lounge chair. What I'm trying to tell you, girl, is that you're looking at this situation through tinted lenses. Miss Doris took a deep breath. You're assuming that Joel's career will be like your father's. That he'll have the same priorities, and most importantly, that he'll react the same way and pick his music over you. You don't know that that's what'll happen. Michelle thought about what Miss Doris said for a moment. Was she projecting? Maybe so, but most people she'd gotten to know in the industry had behaved that way. Granted, they'd mostly been in her father's band, but still. Was there a different way? Could they possibly make this work? Here's my advice, the older woman said. Forget about all that, and enjoy the moment. See where this goes. Spend time with Joel, and talk about anything and everything. You'll learn a lot about another person by talking and listening. I like that idea. I really don't need to make a life-altering decision right now, do I? Michelle smiled. Her heart already felt lighter just talking things through with Miss Doris. You don't. It's not like you're trying to drag him to the altar by Christmas, Miss Doris snickered. Michelle broke out into a full belly laugh. Definitely not. It's quiet, Joel said as he set up at the roasted bean. Not that there was a lot of setup. He kept it simple with his acoustic guitar and a couple of microphones on a stand. That and his song list were all he needed to fill the room with catchy tunes. He'd come up with the list late the night before, picking from a few of his favorite Christmas songs and mixing in a few year-round favorites that were big hits in the past. He loved the energy of the crowd when he could get them to tap their feet and sing along. That's when the big tips started to pour in too. Not that those were likely. It was hard to make tips when only two patrons sat in the shop. It's been slow all day. The bake sale at the church is drawing a lot of traffic, and I'm sure folks are at home or visiting with family. It'll pick up a little later. Mitch didn't look concerned. Why don't you come sit for a few while it's quiet? We haven't had a chance to catch up lately. The older man grabbed two mugs, filled them with house blend coffee, and headed to the small table next to the corner spot Joel had set up to play. Joel set his guitar in its stand and joined his friend. He gratefully accepted the mug of coffee. He could use the extra caffeine after getting up early to make it to the bake sale, only to get stuck in traffic on the way to the church. The bake sale had a great turnout. Mitch raised his eyebrows. You went? Don't sound so surprised. It was for a good cause, and I wanted to support Miss Doris. And see Michelle, Mitch mused. And see Michelle. Joel smiled at the memory of their brief meeting. It was hard to believe how important she'd become to him after knowing her for such a short time. You two are getting pretty serious, eh? We are. I like spending time with her, but... Joel trailed off. Spit it out, Mitch said. There's something that's been bugging you for the last couple of days. It's her dad. Hmm, it really is getting serious if she's introduced you to her parents. Mitch looked surprised. That's not it. I mean, I haven't met them. Joel paused again, trying to think of the best way to explain what had been bothering him. Her dad is Curtis Martell. Ah, Mitch nodded, understanding washing over his face. He's a pretty big deal. He is, Joel agreed. And that's the problem. I don't get it. 
This is a good thing, not a problem, right? He could get your demo in the hands of all sorts of people. Heck, he could probably get you a record deal with nothing more than a phone call. Exactly. Joel's shoulder slumped. I don't want her to think I'm dating her because of her connections. And I don't want to make it because I happen to be involved with Curtis Martell's daughter. I get it. You want to do this on your own, prove that you have what it takes. Mitch smiled. I'm proud of you. Not a lot of people would turn down an opportunity like that. It would be meaningless. Joel played with the sugar packets on the table. And I don't want it to drive a wedge between Michelle and me. How's the record deal fund going then, if you're determined to do this the old-fashioned way? Mitch asked. Did Marcel give you a good deal? He owes me a favor or two that I could call in if need be. Joel didn't know what Mitch had done in the past to warrant such a favor, and he was pretty sure he didn't want to know. I'm right on track. Marcel made me a sweet deal for Christmas Day. I should have the demo cut and ready to send to New York by the first of the year. He couldn't help the proud smile that spread across his face. You've got a guy that promised to get it in the hands of a producer, right? Mitch leaned back in his chair and sipped his own coffee. Joel nodded. Good, good. It's a big step in the right direction. Can I give you a bit of advice, though, from someone who's been around the block a time or two? Of course. Joel leaned in, ready to listen to what his friend had to say. Don't hang all your hopes on this one connection. I've seen stuff like this fall through or go nowhere. He put his cup down and looked right at Joel. It isn't a reflection on your music or your work. Sometimes the timing isn't right or it doesn't make it into the hands of the person that will help you break through. Expect to be rejected and be ready to try again. I am, Joel said. He meant it. He'd spoken to enough musicians to know the chances of getting an actual record deal were small, and the chances of the record taking off and selling enough to make a decent living were even slimmer. I know it's a long shot, and making it will be an uphill battle. I don't mind the work, and I'm sure I'll learn to deal with the rejections. I'm ready to do whatever it takes to go after my dream. Mitch smiled. That's the attitude. You'll go a long way with that. Half the battle is just showing up and putting in the work. I have a feeling you'll make it big one of these days. He stood and picked up their cups. I'd better get back to work. Looks like business is finally starting to pick up. By the way, you're looking happier than I've ever seen you. Michelle is good for you. Don't worry about her dad. Get to know her better while she's down here and go from there. If it's meant to be, you two will work it out. Joel pushed in his chair and headed back to his guitar. Time to play some tunes and collect some tips. He still had a couple hundred dollars to raise and not a lot of time to do it. He would worry about his future with Michelle another day. The afternoon and early evening went by quickly. Traffic to the small coffee shop picked up and many patrons stayed to listen to a few songs before heading back out to run more Christmas errands or join family for various holiday activities. The quick turnover meant even more tips and his jar was filling up quickly. Joel hoped he'd clear at least $200 to help offset some of the cost of the alternator. A couple of gigs like this and he might just raise the funds in time. If not, he wasn't sure what he would do. Maybe Marcel would float him the remaining balance. Joel hoped it wouldn't come to that. It was dark outside by the time Mitch turned the yes, we're open sign around to display the sorry, we're closed message. Joel played one more request as the last of the night's customers finished their coffees and snacks. By the time he'd finished packing up and disassembling the microphone stand, Mitch had started putting up chairs to sweep and mop the main room. He walked over to lend his friend a hand. Hang on for a minute, Mitch told him before disappearing into the back. He came back a few minutes later and handed Joel a plain envelope. Merry Christmas. I know it's a little early, but things are gonna get busy the next few days, and I didn't want to miss the chance to give this to you. He turned and went back behind the counter. 
Joel shouldered his guitar case and opened the letter as he walked to the door. He couldn't believe his eyes. Joel turned to speak to Mitch. It's yours, the coffee shop owner said. To help get that record deal off the ground, with or without that guy from New York. Now get out of here and write some songs. Chapter 7 $2,000. Joel still couldn't believe it. He'd deposited the check first thing Monday morning and checked his banking app every couple of days throughout the week to make sure the money was still there. With the tips from the last few nights and his latest paycheck, he was way ahead. He had money for rent, groceries, and plenty left over to pay Marcel for the recording studio time. And there was even a little left to carry over into the new year. For someone used to living paycheck to paycheck and saving up every penny to make his dream come true, this was a new experience. He kinda liked it. It took some of the pressure off, which did wonders for his creativity. The songs had poured out of him all week, and he'd spent every spare minute scribbling down lyrics and banging out tunes on anything he could get his hands on. Barry, the owner of the Carolina Theater, had kicked him off the stage's piano on more than one occasion so they could set up for the next show. When he hadn't been busy working or writing music, he'd been seeing Michelle. They had explored the local sculpture gardens, all decorated and lit up for Christmas, walked on the beach in the mid-morning sun before he had to head into work, and spent quite a few late nights watching cheesy Christmas movies and stuffing their faces with popcorn. Every now and then, she'd even helped him work out the harmonies on his songs. She had a great ear and an amazing voice. Joel wished he could talk her into performing with him, but so far, Michelle had shut down any time he'd brought up the subject. He had an idea for something to give her a little nudge, to get over her fears and share her gift with the world. Or, at least the locals and tourists on Palmer Island. They day had arrived. Joel had a knot in his stomach. What if his plan didn't work? Would she forgive him? Only one way to find out. He started to knock. The door opened the moment his knuckles hit the oak. Oh, you surprised me. I wasn't expecting you. Miss Doris clutched her hand to her chest, grabbing her winter coat. I was about to head out to the Christmas market. That's where we're headed. I'm here to pick up Michelle, Joel said. Sorry I scared you. Bad timing, I guess. Come on in. I'm sure she'll be ready in a minute. Miss Doris turned and walked back into the house. Joel followed and waited in the small entryway. She returned a moment later. She's right behind me. I'll see you two lovebirds at the fair. She flashed him a smile and waltzed out the door, pulling it closed behind her. Sorry, Michelle huffed a few minutes later. Her cheeks were red and she was busy applying a bit of chapstick to her lips before putting the tube back into her purse. I lost track of time. What did you do? Run up from the pier? Joel asked, trying hard to suppress a smirk. Worse, Michelle replied. Got dressed and this hair under control in 30 seconds flat. That's got to be some sort of world record. He looked her up and down. She looked put together as always, except. You missed a bit here. He reached up and twisted his finger around the single strand of blonde hair she'd missed when pulling it up in a ponytail. He heard her breath catch at the intimate gesture. Joel slowly let the strand run through his fingers before he tucked it gently behind her ear. That's better, he said and kissed her on the nose to relieve the tension that had built between them in the moment. Tension that didn't feel appropriate while he was standing in an empty house with her. Thanks, Michelle breathed. Ready to go? Joel nodded and opened the door. The cool air felt good on his face. When had he gotten so flushed? They spent Saturday's sunny, late morning at the fair, walking around the stalls and helping Mitch out with the hot chocolate cart. Before long, it was time for Joel to get ready for his performance slot by the large Christmas tree. Michelle strolled with him over to the small stage. I was wondering. He started. What? Michelle squeezed his hand encouragingly and looked up at him with those beautiful baby blue eyes. 
Would you consider singing a song with me? Something like Baby It's Cold Outside, maybe? I would love the chance to perform together, and I'm sure the crowd would love it. He held his breath and did his best not to look too hopeful. Oh okay, Michelle stammered. I could do that. Just one song? He nodded. One song and you're done. He couldn't help grinning from ear to ear. I'll call you up. We'll do it toward the end of the set and then get out of here. Michelle nodded. She'd gone pale and a little green around the nose, and he hoped he'd made the right decision. She needed a little push to get out of her own way to share her gift with the world. Joel sent up a little prayer, hoped he'd done the right thing, then took the stage. The crowd knew him well and was ready. The first song requests had come in before he jumped up on stage. Hold your horses, he said into the microphone. Why don't we start with something upbeat and fast to get warmed up? Feel free to stamp your feet and sing along. He played the first few notes of Jingle Bell Rock and the crowd exploded. He loved that feeling. That was why he wanted to make it as a musician. To experience that surge in energy and joy every day. It wasn't about the money or the fame for him. It was about making that connection and bringing joy to the people who'd come to hear him. It was intoxicating, better than anything he'd had to drink in his 26 years on earth. Joel worked his way through his set, keeping an eye on Michelle. She was right there in the front row, beaming at him and singing along with the crowd whenever he played a popular Christmas song. He was half afraid she would disappear on him after his suggestion for a duet. I have a special treat for you today, he started, his eyes locked with Michelle. My beautiful friend Michelle has agreed to join me for a song. Come on up here. The crowd cheered and whistled as Michelle took the quick walk and the three steps up on the plywood stage. She stepped right next to him and waved at the crowd. Ready to sing, he asked. She nodded, and he started to pluck the strings of his guitar and sing the opening verse of Baby It's Cold Outside. He kept a close eye on Michelle, trying to judge how she was holding up. She handled it like a pro. The first few lines, her voice was a little soft, and if you really paid attention, you could hear it shake just a bit. But it didn't take her long to get into the song and let the music take over. By the end, they were both breathless and beaming. The crowd, it seemed, had enjoyed the performance as much as they had. You were amazing he told her before brushing a quick kiss across her lips. He took her hand and started to walk off the stage, to the dismay of their audience. Michelle couldn't believe it. She'd done it. She'd stood up on stage and sang her heart out. A heart that was still beating a million miles a minute. She made her way across the small stage she shared with Joel. His hand still held hers, which turned out to be a good thing. In the excitement, Michelle missed the last step and would have fallen flat on her face if he hadn't held her up. That could have been an embarrassing end to their performance. Ready to get out of here? he asked. He would practically had to yell it into her ear as they wove through the excited crowd. Michelle nodded and followed him through a few side alleys of the temporary Christmas market. It didn't take them long to reach Joel's VW Golf. He gently put his guitar in the back before walking around to open the passenger side door for her. That was something else, she said, still breathing hard as she tried to force her heart rate to come down. It was. You were amazing. Girl, you have some pipes. Those riffs at the end were. He seemed at a loss for words, and it made Michelle giggle. Really good, he finally finished with a sincerity in his voice and his eyes that made her heart go from fluttering like a little bird to stopping completely. The butterflies in her stomach, on the other hand, started to do somersaults. By the time he leaned over and brushed her cheek with his thumb, it felt like an entire circus had taken residence in her abdomen. You really were amazing, he mumbled before brushing his lips over hers and nibbling on the corner of her mouth. Michelle sighed, happily then turned her head, just enough to get a real kiss. A girl deserved a good kiss after overcoming her fears, stage fright, and previous misconceptions and misgivings about performing music. 
she'd enjoyed herself, and that hadn't surprised anyone more than Michelle Baxter. Listen, Joel said a few minutes later, after cranking up the car. I have to work this afternoon. I can take you back to Miss Doris's house, or if you're interested, you could come with me and see the show. It's fun, but it would be a long day. I don't get off until around 11 tonight. He looked at her, waiting for her reply. Michelle considered it for a minute. It would make for a long afternoon and evening, but she wasn't ready to say goodbye. Hanging out with Joel, between shows, and watching him play didn't sound like a bad idea. Sure, I'll come hang out. Great. She heard the joy in Joel's voice. That alone was worth losing a couple of hours of sleep. We usually order takeout between shows for dinner. Does that work? She nodded. Is there anything you need from your place before we head up? Michelle shook her head. Joel pulled out of the parking lot and started to drive north. The Carolina Theater looked like an old-fashioned European opera building, both on the outside and once they'd stepped into the large foyer. Two large staircases rose up in a swoop on either side of the tall room, a golden chandelier hanging between them. Large Christmas trees sat next to each red carpet-covered staircase. It couldn't be easy to keep those clean, Michelle mused as her eyes roamed over the space. Joel spoke to an older lady at the ticket counter. He returned a few minutes later and handed her a ticket. That's for the first show. The second one is sold out, sorry. No worries. Once might be enough, she joked to lighten the mood. Haha, <laughs> very funny. Let's head backstage, and I'll get you a pass so you can hang out when you're not watching the show, from over there. He pointed up to the balcony as he led her through the main seating area, towards the stage. Joel opened a door off to the side and they entered the back of the stage. Workers were busy arranging sets and testing lights. A lot of shouting and pointing was going on. Michelle got the feeling it was crunch time and did her best to stay out of everyone's way. Joel introduced her to Barry, the owner of the Carolina Theater, and his boss. He was a charming older man with a rich voice. She wondered if he would perform as well. Unless she was very much mistaken, he'd have an excellent singing voice, too. Barry happily gave her a stage pass and asked if she was a musician as well. Before Joel could let the cat out of the bag about their duet, she shook her head. Just a lover of good holiday music, she told the man. You're in for a treat then. Barry smiled and leaned in conspiratorially. A word of warning, the girls in the audience tend to have a bit of a crush on Joel over here. Hope that won't be a problem for you. With that, he left the small lounge area. Michelle turned to look at Joel. His face was as red as a beet. So, it's true? You're the heartthrob of the show, she asked, enjoying it just a little to watch him squirm. I'm the youngest and newest member of the cast, so yeah, the women tend to crush on me a little bit, especially the high school girls. He looked so embarrassed, it was adorable. Michelle decided to end his misery. I get it. Don't worry about it. After all, how bad can it be? Michelle was in her seat long before the show started and entertained herself watching people and listening in to their conversations. Most were excited about the show, some discussed the arrival of family members. A few were worried about being behind on their Christmas shopping. One guy grabbed her attention by sharing with his seat neighbor that he'd gotten a job on a crew that was decorating one of the houses in a gated neighborhood just south of Palmer Island. At first, Michelle thought she'd heard wrong but the guy was being paid 20 bucks an hour, along with a crew of 10 other locals, to set up Christmas trees and hang lights at a million-dollar vacation home. The man's seatmate was just as unbelieving and asked him to confirm. From the sound of it, it was one of the best-paying and most sought-after seasonal jobs in town. You had to get an in with Shelby Blake, the local interior designer, and stay on her good side to keep the position. The show itself was just as much fun as the people watching. Joel was a total professional who kept everyone enthralled with his songs and his music. Sure, it was cheesy, but it was Christmas time after all. Who wouldn't love a few good songs, nostalgic stories, 
and some jokes that involved someone getting run over by a reindeer. And Joel had been right, it was bad. Every teenage girl and young woman in the crowd had her eyes glued to the stage when Joel was up. Many of them had hooted and hollered when he'd begun to sing. During intermission, she decided to take a stroll around the lobby and stepped into the gift shop. She walked to the back, and her hand flew to her mouth to suppress a surprised laugh. Was there really an entire display of Joel's glamour shots in his stage outfit, posing with his electric guitar? The pictures were even signed, and from what she could tell, they were a popular souvenir with the younger female crowd. She would tease him endlessly about it, after she bought a copy for herself. A girl needed proof, after all. Michelle stopped by the concession stand on her way back, picking up one of those cheer wine sodas she'd heard so much about. We just got them in. Been getting a lot of requests for it lately, the young man behind the counter told her while handing her a cup of bright red soda. She thanked him and made her way back to her seat just in time for the second half of the show. Joel came and got her after the show and the obligatory meet and greet with the VIP guests. They walked backstage through one of the side entrances and joined the rest of the cast in the break room. Everyone was keyed up, and the noise level of the various high-spirited conversations and laughs were deafening. It was kinda nice and very different from what she remembered of after parties. For one, there were no groupies hanging around, trying to take Joel's attention away from her. And, since they had another show to perform, pizza and soda was as indulgent as their partying got. Michelle giggled when she realized this was the equivalent of a kid's birthday party instead of the usual sex, drugs, and rock and roll cliché. All too soon, it was time for Joel and the rest of the crew to reset and get ready for the late evening show. Michelle curled up on the couch in the corner of the break room with a romance novel she'd found tucked behind one of the cushions. Before long, she was drawn into the author's tale of pirates, high seas, and the bravery of the young widow doing whatever it took to make it to the land of opportunity. Despite the gripping tale, she must have drifted off to sleep, because the next thing Michelle remembered was Joel stroking her hair and gently shaking her shoulders. She blinked and looked right into his beautiful eyes. Hey, she mumbled sleepily, barely noticing the few crew members who were filing into the room instead of heading straight home. Hey, sleepyhead. Let's get you home. Joel helped her sit up and grabbed her purse and coat from the chair next to the couch. The drive back to Palmer Island was quiet. It took them a long time to start talking, both too weary after the long day they'd had. Can I ask you something? Joel said into the darkness, his eyes firmly on the road. Shoot, Michelle answered, wondering what had caused the serious tone in his voice. Your dad's name is Martel. Why do you go by Michelle Baxter? Joel glanced her way quickly before returning his gaze to the dark road. Not a lot of cars made the trek south to Palmer Island this time of the night, but it never hurt to be cautious. Miss Doris had warned her to keep an eye out for deer after leaving the busy neighborhoods on the south end of Myrtle Beach. Ancient oaks and tall pines lined the four-lane highway that led all the way to the barrier island with its two bridges. I changed my name when I started high school. My dad's band had made a big comeback the year before, and all everyone at my old school wanted to talk about was Wild Horse. I guess I got tired of being Curtis Martel's daughter instead of plain Michelle. My parents were divorced by that time, and my mom was getting remarried. I decided to take her maiden name. Which means my mom, my dad, and I each have different last names. How's that for a dysfunctional modern family? Michelle laughed wryly before glancing over at Joel. Hey, at least you know who your dad is, and you still spend time with both of them, right? Michelle nodded. That's better than my family. He flashed her a quick smile. Did it help? Did what help? Oh, the name change? Actually, it did. Michelle thought back to the first day of high school. She'd moved across country to live with her mom. At least for a while. Eventually, it came out, but my dad talked his band into playing our prom, which kind of made up for it. It had been an epic night and the only time, in as long as she could remember, 
that she'd been 100% happy to be the daughter of one of the founding members of the band. What about since then? Michelle thought for a minute about how to best explain the complicated relationship she had with her dad. Mostly, I've been keeping a low profile. I made a deal with my dad after high school and the fallout from that prom concert. The tabloids had been full of pictures of the night and reporters followed her around for weeks. No pictures and no public appearances. When he comes to visit or we meet somewhere, he does what he can to throw the reporters and photographers off the scent. I make him wear a disguise when we go out in public together. It's been working pretty well so far. Aside from the principal, no one at my school is aware of my connection to a celebrity. It's allowed me to live a pretty normal life. It was something she wouldn't trade for anything. After years of living in the spotlight, being able to go grocery shopping or running out to the mailbox in sweatpants was a blessing. I wouldn't mind meeting your dad sometime. Michelle stiffened. Was he trying to get close to her to get access to her dad? She could feel him glance over at her. She should say something. I like what we have, and I hope we move towards something more serious. Call me old-fashioned, but I wouldn't mind asking your father's permission to date you. Okay, that's a little, um, old-fashioned. Michelle couldn't hide her surprise. His request was a little strange, but also kind of sweet. I like you, and I want to do this right, he said with a shrug. Or we can keep parents out of the picture. It isn't like you'll get a chance to meet mine. Michelle could tell there was more to that story, but they were both too tired to get into it. Why don't we see where this goes, and then we'll revisit the parents' idea, she suggested. Deal. Joel walked her to the door of Miss Doris's. Thanks for a fun night, she said and was surprised how much she meant it. Thanks for coming. It was nice to have someone there. He took a step to close the distance between them. That was a first. He leaned down and brushed his hand over her hair. I liked knowing you were out there, watching. Before he could finish, she raised up on her toes and wrapped her arms around his neck. She pulled him down for a kiss. You're welcome, she mumbled in between toe-curling kisses. Michelle, is that you? She heard Miss Doris call from down the hall after she'd closed the front door behind her. Come here, for a minute, hun. Michelle followed the sound of the voice to Miss Doris's bedroom and stepped inside. She hadn't been in that room, and the first thing she noticed was that the entire back wall was one large bookshelf. From what she could see, it was filled from floor to ceiling with romance novels. Miss Doris sat up in bed, holding a historical romance Michelle remembered reading over the summer. Is everything okay? It was strange, the older woman had waited up for her. She was usually sound asleep at this hour. As was Michelle. She tried to suppress the yawn she felt coming up. It didn't work. I know it's late. This will only take a moment. Your father has been calling. He left a couple of numbers and messages for you. He asked me to tell you to call him back as soon as you get in. Miss Doris leaned over to the small nightstand and picked up a stack of notes. She handed them to Michelle. Give him a call. He sounded worried. Michelle took the notes to her room and sat down on her bed. There were quite a few messages in two different handwritings. Miss Doris had even noted the date and time of each call. Her father must have been trying to reach her since she left for the Christmas market with Joel. She wondered why he hadn't called her directly. Michelle dug around her purse and pulled out her phone. The screen was black. She hadn't realized the battery was dead. No telling how long her phone had been off. She didn't recall looking at it all day. She'd been too distracted. Michelle pulled the charger out of the small nightstand and plugged the phone in. She let it charge for a few minutes while she got ready for bed and then dialed the main number her father had left. It was early morning the next day in London already with the five-hour time difference. Her dad picked up on the second ring. Michelle? Hi, I just got your messages. I hope I didn't wake you. 
Michelle scooted back on the bed and put a pillow behind her back. My phone died, and I hadn't noticed until I got home just now. Sorry if I worried you. It's okay. You're a grown woman. I tend to forget that sometimes. She could hear him chuckle on the other end of the line. And no, you didn't wake me. We had a late rehearsal. I'm trying to wind down and get a few hours of sleep. Hopefully housekeeping will stay out of my room this time. How about you? What did you do today? I had a pretty long day too, Michelle said, unsuccessfully trying to suppress another yawn. I woke up early. The seagulls were making all sorts of racket right outside my door. She'd been ready to throw her pillow at the squawking creatures who wouldn't let her sleep in. Instead, she'd joined Miss Doris and her grandniece for coffee on the screened-in porch. With the door to the living room open and sunlight streaming in, it had been warm enough to sit out there. Let's see. I went to the Christmas market, helped out at the coffee cart, watched Joel perform. Hold on. Who's Joel? Her father interrupted. Oh, I didn't get a chance to tell you about him yet. We bumped into each other in a coffee shop down here on my first day. Literally. I spilled white chocolate mocha all over the poor guy. That sounds like my girl, her father chuckled. She was known as a bit of a klutz in her family. Tell me more about this guy. When do I get to meet him? I think you'll like him. He's a good guy who's making it on his own. He doesn't have family, but he works hard, has his own place right down on the beach, and get this. He drives a 96 Volkswagen Golf. You sound happy, baby. That's all that counts. Are things getting serious between the two of you? Maybe. This wasn't exactly the kind of conversation she wanted to have with her dad. Especially not over the phone. Good. Be smart about it though. Make sure you two have something before you get yourself in too deep. And I definitely want to meet the guy. Michelle groaned. In the past, meetings between her dad and boyfriends hadn't gone too well. They'd either run scared or were so starstruck that Michelle ended up wondering if they'd stayed with her because they liked her or because they'd fanboyed over her dad. It wasn't a good way to start a serious relationship, it was yet another handicap of growing up with a famous father. Dad, cool it, she said. Besides, you'd have to see me first, before I could even consider introducing you to him. And that seems to be a bit of a problem. She couldn't keep the bitterness out of her voice. I know, baby girl. I'm working on it. I would love to spend Christmas with you. You know that. Michelle nodded. I know. Sorry, I said that. No, you're right. I messed this up. The other end of the line grew quiet and Michelle started to wonder if their connection got dropped. So the two of you hung out all day, her dad asked a little while later. We did. We did the Christmas market thing and then I watched him perform. And guess what, daddy? Michelle couldn't wait to tell her father about their duet. Wait a minute. The guy is a musician? What about your rules, her father interrupted. He is, and it was sort of an accident. I didn't realize he played for a living until we'd, m, become close. Michelle felt the heat rising in her cheeks. Good thing they weren't Skyping. So, he's a professional. Are you sure about this? You've been pretty adamant that you wouldn't date someone in the biz. Her father was right. That had been the cornerstone of her entire dating and future life philosophy. I know, she said softly. But sometimes, the heart wants what the heart wants. And you have to throw caution and the rules to the wind. I'm proud of you, baby girl. This guy must be pretty special if you're willing to give this a shot, her father said. Now, you were really excited about something before I interrupted you. Go on. You're not going to believe this. He talked me into getting up on stage at the Christmas fair, and we sang Baby, It's Cold Outside. There was only stunned silence from the other end of the line. It made her giggle. I wish I had been there, was all he finally said. Chapter 8 
Michelle woke up the next morning and glanced at her phone. She'd slept in and missed a bunch of messages and emails from friends. There were even missed call notifications. No one other than her parents called her cell phone. Yet she saw calls from a few close friends from back home. She sat up and started to scroll through the text messages. This couldn't be right. It wasn't possible. Michelle put her phone down, in shock, and splashed some cold water on her face. She walked back to the bed and picked up her phone. Her hand shook as she clicked the link to the YouTube video everyone was talking about. It couldn't be. Yet there it was. The clip was under three minutes long, shaky, and obviously shot with a crappy phone. Impossible. The video had over two million views already and too many comments to count. She closed out of the app and called Joel. This was too strange a situation to discuss via text. Did you see it? She asked the moment he picked up his phone. Yes, Joel sounded excited. Did you see how many views it has already? It's going viral, big time. It's horrible, she exclaimed before dropping back on the bed. My friends back in Pennsylvania are already texting me about it. Really? What was with the excitement? Didn't he realize that this was turning her life upside down? Yes, really. How do we stop it? Can we force them to take it down? Maybe my dad can call his lawyer. What? Why would you want it taken down? You sound amazing. Have you looked at the comments you're getting? She hadn't, and that was beside the point anyway. Why didn't he understand that this was a serious problem? You don't get it, do you? She finally said after listening to him read some of the comments out loud to her. Get what? Joel stopped, and his tone changed. This is the last thing I wanted. It's going to be a nightmare. It's already all over the internet. It won't be long before the online gossip mags pick it up, and that means paparazzi. The word alone sent shivers down her back. She still had nightmares of them chasing her down the street and into school. And that's when she realized calling her dad was useless. There was nothing he or his team of lawyers could do to stop this. Sure, he could hire protection and help her escape to an unknown location but that would only work for so long. With this kind of buzz, they would be relentless. I'm coming over. This really isn't a bad thing, Michelle. We can work with this. Maybe add a duet to the demo album if you're up for it. Don't bother. She hung up the phone and tossed it across the room. She was furious. How dare he? This, this was why she didn't date musicians. She couldn't believe he was trying to take advantage of this horrible situation and asked her to sing on his stupid demo. A soft knock on the door pulled Michelle out of her mental ranting and raving. Is everything okay? She heard Miss Doris ask. Michelle forced herself up and opened the door. I'm sorry. I had some upsetting news and threw my phone. Not my smartest move. She shrugged apologetically and picked up her phone. Drats. The screen had a couple of big cracks in it. It really wasn't her day, and it wasn't even ten o'clock yet. Why don't you come in the kitchen and get some coffee? I'll scramble you up some eggs and you can tell me about it, Miss Doris suggested. If you want to. Michelle nodded and grabbed the cardigan off the back of the chair in the corner. She suddenly felt chilled to the bone. The hot coffee Miss Doris handed her when she entered the kitchen helped warm her up. I had a strange call this morning, Miss Doris said after pouring her own cup. Someone called asking about Curtis Martell's daughter. What did you say? Michelle held her breath and hoped for the best. That I'd never heard the name and didn't know who they were talking about. Miss Doris smiled at her over her cup. Thank you. Michelle got up and hugged the older woman. She couldn't help the tears that rolled down her cheeks. It had all been too much. How had her entire life turned into such a mess overnight? All because of one little song. Tell me what happened. Maybe I can offer some advice. I have been around the block a time or two, 
Miss Doris wiggled her eyebrows, and it made Michelle laugh. The simple act made her feel a little better. Michelle walked back to her chair and sat down. She took a sip of coffee. Here's what happened. It didn't take long to fill Miss Doris in on everything that had taken place the day before and the worldwide consequence of their fun little duet. Can I see it? Miss Doris asked. Michelle picked up her phone. The screen was cracked, but it still worked. She played the video and explained why it was such a big deal. That was lovely. It's hard to believe something like that would cause you so much grief. It felt nice to have Miss Doris's support and she heard the compassion in her voice. Michelle was sure she didn't grasp the severity of the situation, but it was good to feel like someone was in her corner. Especially since it seemed like Joel wasn't. Thank you for listening and for understanding, she said. You're the only one so far who didn't get all excited about this video. Miss Doris nodded. Joel, she asked. Michelle nodded her head, tears filling her eyes. She wiped them away angrily. Why did it hurt so much that Joel didn't get it? Because she wanted him on her side, Michelle realized. She loved him and wanted him to comfort her and help her through all the turmoil. She loved him. The realization hit her like a brick. That's why it felt like her heart could shatter into a thousand tiny pieces. She took a deep breath. This wasn't the time to examine the complicated feelings she had for Joel Fisher. She needed to focus and find a way out of this mess. She wasn't going to let one grainy little cell phone video ruin her life. Tell me about it. You talked to him already? Miss Doris reached across the worn kitchen table and put her hand over Michelle's. I did. It's why I threw my phone against the wall. She felt the warmth rise along her neck and into her checks. She pulled on the collar of her t-shirt, it suddenly felt uncomfortably tight. He's all excited about it and thinks it will help him land a record deal. Miss Doris nodded her head, the gray curls bouncing up and down. That makes sense. It's nice to know that something good may come out of this mess. The statement made Michelle stop. She'd been so focused on the negative and how the viral video would impact her, she hadn't given much thought to how it would affect Joel. Miss Doris was right, Michelle realized. Something good could come out of this, and what kind of person would she be if she begrudged Joel this? Not a very nice one, that was for sure. He wants me to record a song with him for his demo album. Michelle hated how shaky her voice sounded. She swallowed hard and gripped the side of the table. And that's not something you're prepared to do? Or want to do? Miss Doris asked, keeping her warm eyes fixed on Michelle. I'm not sure, she admitted. When he asked me, I got pretty mad. It feels like he's using me to get ahead with his music. But you're right. Something good could come from this, and he is such a good musician. He deserves a shot at making it. Michelle closed her eyes and took a deep breath. It was fun to be up on stage with him and perform together. You looked like you had a lot of fun. And you have a lovely voice, dear. Miss Doris smiled at her encouragingly. Can I make a suggestion? Michelle nodded. Her mind and emotions were jumbled, she could use all the help she could get. Why don't you head out for a little walk on the beach to clear your head? See how you feel about all this afterwards. It was a good idea, and Michelle started to get up as Miss Doris continued. And then, I think you should talk to Joel. I can't believe the two of you would let a little something like this get between you. Michelle barked out a laugh. It didn't seem so little to her at the moment. But Miss Doris was right. She owed it to Joel, and to herself, to at least talk about all this. In person. You're right, she said, before sending a quick text to Joel, asking him to meet her at the house. His reply was immediate. He would be there in about half an hour. That left just enough time for a quick stroll down the beach. Joel was sitting in the living room with Miss Doris, her grandniece Sarah, and Sarah's boyfriend and baby daddy Ryan. 
Michelle had spent a little time with the young couple here and there and still couldn't believe how they'd met in Aruba, lost track of each other for eight months, and then Ryan literally bumped into Sarah on Main Street here on Palmer Island right after Thanksgiving. The pair had been spending a lot of time getting to know each other ever since. Hi, she said, waving at everyone as she stepped into the warm living room. The brisk walk had done her good. It had given her a chance to calm down and start to process the emotions that had been stirred up. It had also given her some perspective. Yes, it would get some attention in the press, and there was a good chance photographers were on their way to the island right now, but it wasn't the end of the world, and it wouldn't actually ruin her life unless she let it. She felt a lot more composed and ready to talk. Joel patted the seat next to him on the couch and she walked over and sat down. His lips curled up a little, but he made no attempt to touch her, let alone kiss her. I'm sorry about the way I reacted on the phone earlier, he said after she'd gotten comfortable. I wasn't listening and didn't realize what a mess has been created for you. I'm sorry. What remained of Michelle's anger and frustration melted away at those words. She returned his smile and scooted close enough to lean up against him. I'm sorry too. I overreacted. I'm sure it won't be as big of a deal as I made it out to be. Sarah and Ryan, who were snuggled up on the other couch, both nodded their heads in agreement. Viral videos have a pretty short lifespan these days, Ryan said. This should blow over in a couple of days. A week or two max. Which means it won't really help my album either. Joel leaned back and pulled her closer to him. Besides, I have a plan, and I'm going to stick to it. I'm sorry, I tried to pull you in and take advantage. I got excited and wasn't thinking straight. He leaned over so he could look at her. Can you forgive me? There's nothing to forgive, Michelle said, brushing his cheek with the back of her hand. It felt rough. He must have rushed over without shaving, she realized. I overreacted and panicked. I'm sorry as well. Wonderful, Miss Doris clapped her hands together. We'll wait it out, and in the meantime, I wonder if there's a way we could put these 15 minutes of fame to some good use. How would the two of you feel about a small concert in the church? We'd take donations at the door. All proceeds would go to the Gifts for Kids project. We could put a present under the trees of a lot more needy kids. She looked expectantly at Joel and Michelle. Is there enough time to organize and run it? Sarah asked. Leave that to me. We can do it early Sunday evening. She looked over at Joel and Michelle. If that works for both of you? Joel nodded and Michelle sighed. How could she say no to Miss Doris? We'll do it. She stood up and held her hand out to Joel. Let's go. We'd better figure out what to sing and start practicing. The small community church was packed when Joel and Michelle arrived. As they set up for a quick sound check, more people came in. Most seats were filled, and it was still a good half an hour before the short Christmas concert would start. Joel had enlisted the help of one of his musician friends, a guy named Russell, to provide some acoustic percussion. He arrived with a small wooden box that looked a little like an old-fashioned speaker. Michelle wasn't sure what to make of it until he sat on it, like a stool, and started tapping a simple beat. It was amazing how such a rich sound came out of something that was basically a plywood box. After they'd finished their sound check, the three of them walked back to a smaller meeting room to hang out until their performance started. Russell excused himself to go check on his daughter. Her mother had dropped her off, and the girl sat in the church with a friend of his. Holding up okay? Joel asked before he pulled her into a hug. You look a little green in the face. Just a little stage fright. I'm sure I'll be fine. Michelle kept telling herself that she would be okay once she got up there. That didn't make it any easier, this was worse than the fair. They'd perform a set of ten songs, with a short break halfway through to give Miss Doris a chance to tell everyone about the church's gifts for kids program and hopefully collect a few more donations. The door opened, and Miss Doris came in grinning from ear to ear. Did you see how many people showed up? 
This is going to be amazing. She strode over to Michelle and Joel and engulfed them both in a hug. Her short arms didn't quite reach, but it was heartfelt nonetheless. Thank you for doing this. You're changing the lives of so many underprivileged children. She let go and started to back away. Sorry to run, but there's so much to take care of. I'll come get you when it's time to start. She waved and was out the door before Michelle could blink. That was nice of her. Michelle pulled away from Joel and ran her fingers through her blonde hair. I can do this. It's for a good cause. She took a couple of deep, calming breaths and closed her eyes. That's it. Keep focusing on that. Think of the kids who will wake up and find presents under the tree. Picture how excited they'll be. Can you see their big, beaming smiles? Joel asked. Michelle nodded. Her eyes were still closed and she could see it all like a movie. It flashed from scene to scene, showing her different young children ripping open presents and playing with their new toys. The mental imagery was working. She could feel her heart rate slow and her mind calm. She took a few more slow breaths. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. Then she opened her eyes. She was ready to do this. Miss Doris came in to escort them up to the front of the church a little while later. Michelle, Joel, and Russell had just finished a rundown of their set, and all three of them felt confident. They followed Miss Doris and got in position while she introduced them to the crowd. Michelle took a quick glance around. It was even more packed than before. She wasn't sure it was possible to fit any more people into the small brick building. Her heart sped up and then stuttered. Michelle blinked and then found one friendly face in the first row of seats. It was a young girl, and she briefly wondered if it could be Russell's daughter. Her suspicion was confirmed when the girl waved at Russell. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw him smile and wink in reply. Michelle kept her gaze on the young girl, determined to sing only for her. It took the pressure off and made her calm back down. For the millionth time, she told herself she could do it. That's when she heard the first chords from Joel's guitar. Russell drummed a slow little beat, and all three of them started to sing. Her nerves were forgotten as she lost herself in the music and the lyrics of some of her favorite Christmas songs. By the third one, she looked up and gazed around the room. The audience got into it right along with them, it was fun. All too soon, the brief concert ended, despite not one but two encores, which were really just repeats of the first two songs they'd performed. Neither Joel nor Russell had been willing to perform something they hadn't practiced together, and with the short notice, they hadn't had a chance to prepare extra material. They met with Miss Doris, Sarah, Ryan, and a group of women who ran the charity event after it was all over. You guys were amazing, Sarah exclaimed, before waddling up to hug Michelle. It was slightly awkward with Sarah's almost full-term belly, and they both ended up laughing, crying, and hugging. Apparently, coming down from a performance high threw your hormones into disarray about as much as a pregnancy did. Look at this, Miss Doris pulled her over to a table where ladies busily counted and added up all the donations. There was a pile of personal checks and a huge bucket of cash. Any guess yet how much we made? Joel asked. Betty, one of the church ladies shook her head. I can't begin to guess, but at least a couple of thousand I would say. There's still time to order some toys from Amazon, Ryan said, while scrolling through his phone. If we place some orders tonight, they should be here by the 23rd. Does that give you enough time to wrap and deliver them? Sarah asked. The ladies all nodded and started to crowd around Ryan to help pick toys. Sarah backed away and dropped into one of the oversized chairs. She looked tired. Standing for hours at a time couldn't be easy in her condition. You were amazing, Joel whispered while he wrapped Michelle into a tight hug. She was surprised to find that she felt amazing. Performing with Joel had been a rush and something she wouldn't mind doing again. She wondered how her parents would take it if she did. Chapter 9 Michelle got up early on Christmas Eve and padded into the kitchen to make coffee. 
It was nice to be up before Miss Doris and have the house more or less to herself for a few moments. Michelle carried her coffee out to the screened-in porch. That early in the morning it was chilly, and she wrapped the blanket she'd brought out tighter around her shoulders. The sun started to rise up over the ocean, the first rays dancing across the rolling waves. It was just her and the ever-present seagulls, watching the spectacle Mother Nature put on that special December morning. By the time Michelle stepped back inside to warm up, Miss Doris sat in the kitchen, sipping her own cup of coffee. How was it out there, she asked, looking up as Michelle walked in. Cold, but well worth it. The sunrise is beautiful, Michelle said before she walked over to the counter to pour herself another cup. She wrapped her freezing hands around the warm cup before taking a sip. The hot liquid rushed down into her stomach, warming her up from the inside. She sighed happily. Nothing better on a cold winter morning, Miss Doris commented as her eyes went down to her own coffee. I don't care what they say about the dangers of caffeine. This is the only thing that gets me out of bed when it's this cold. She looked up in time to see Michelle nod her agreement. I feel the same way. Michelle sat down, and they enjoyed the dark brew in silence for a few minutes until they heard the doorbell ring. I wonder who that could be? Miss Doris said, a strange undertone, to her voice. Would you mind getting the door? My back is acting up this morning. Michelle rose. Of course. She walked down the hall and opened the door seconds after the bell rang again. She hoped the noise wouldn't wake Sarah. She assumed the young woman was still asleep. Behind her, she heard Miss Doris speaking to someone on the phone. Strange. She hadn't heard the phone ring. Michelle unlocked the front door and pulled it open. Dad? What are you doing here? Her voice rose in surprise. Hi, baby. How about a hug? Curtis Martell dropped his bag and held out his arms. Michelle fell into them. It's good to see you. She was shivering in the cold, early morning air by the time they stepped back inside. They walked into the kitchen as Sarah slowly made her way down the stairs, a small overnight bag of her own in hand. Miss Doris met them in the hallway. Mr. Martell. Welcome to Palmer Island. I'm glad you found the house. I hope you had a pleasant flight out here. She shook hands with Michelle's father. I hate to rush off, but it seems I'm to become a great great aunt today, she said, pointing at Sarah who had stopped at the bottom of the stairs, gripping the handrail. Seeing the pain in her face, Michelle got the feeling that the young woman was in labor. Are you okay? What can I do to help? Michelle rushed over. Sarah caught her breath and waved her off. I'm fine. We're heading to the hospital. You two make yourselves at home. Michelle, I set up the room down the hall from yours for your father. Take him down there if you don't mind. I'll check in later today. With that, the two women were out the door, leaving a stunned Michelle behind. She knew you were coming? Michelle turned and faced her father. He nodded. I called from the airport in London. I asked her not to say anything. I wanted my visit to be a surprise. He took a few steps toward her and spread out his arms. Surprise! Michelle laughed. He was such a show-off. I can't stay long. I'm taking a flight back tomorrow morning to make the show on Boxing Day. He looked apologetic. That's an awful long way to come for such a short visit, Michelle said. It is, but it's worth it. I get to spend Christmas with you. There was no way I was letting my little girl spend the holidays all by herself in a strange place. He turned his head and looked toward the front door where Miss Doris and Sarah had left a few minutes ago. Maybe I shouldn't have worried so much. Looks like you've made friends already. I did. I'm actually glad I came down here. She was as surprised as her dad looked. It's been nice, and it was good to get out of town for a while. I think I needed that. Plus the weather is much nicer down here. She smiled and gazed out the window. Back in Allentown, there was plenty of icy wind, dirty snow, 
or freezing rain that soaked through every layer of clothing no matter how much you tried to prepare for winter weather. Most importantly though, she'd had plenty of sunshine on Palmer Island, which had done wonders for her mood. No more winter blues. I'm glad, but I still want to apologize for the misunderstanding. That's one of the reasons I wanted to fly over. It felt like something I needed to do in person. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that our plans had changed and that I cancelled our Christmas getaway. He sounded serious, and it felt good to hear the words. I forgive you. How about we forget about it and enjoy the little bit of time we have together? What would you like to do first, she asked. Curtis grinned. Honestly? Michelle nodded at him encouragingly. I'd love to get something to eat. The stuff they served on the plane wasn't edible, and I'm starving. She heard his stomach growl halfway across the room. Not a problem, Michelle couldn't suppress a laugh. How about some bacon, eggs, and toast? I can have that whipped up in a couple of minutes. That sounds amazing. By the time breakfast was ready, Curtis had showered and changed into a simple pair of jeans and a sweatshirt. If he pulled on the baseball cap he was carrying into the kitchen, Michelle was fairly certain no one would recognize her famous father. She wondered if she should put on some sort of disguise as well, now that she was YouTube famous. She blanched. Her father had been in the air and probably had no idea what had happened. Um, there's something I need to tell you. She scooped some bacon and eggs on a plate and set it in front of her dad. Shoot, he said and shoved a big bite of eggs into his mouth. This is good. Michelle nodded her thanks and fixed her own plate to avoid having the conversation for a few more minutes. By the time she'd sat down with her own food and spread butter on her toast, her father was looking at her with raised eyebrows. He had eaten about half his food, but his fork was down, and he was waiting for her to speak. This may be a bit of a surprise, but I, um, sort of performed the other day. Relief flashed over her father's face. Is this about the YouTube video? he asked. Yes. You know about that? Of course. Barry has been calling and texting me about it nonstop. I told him to back off. Barry was her father's manager, and he'd been after her to record a song or do a live performance with the band since he'd heard her sing in a musical in high school. Thank you. You sounded great, by the way. I was surprised, though, he trailed off. I was too. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing. What did you think? He looked at her intently. Michelle knew she had to be honest with him. She owed him that much. I liked it. The energy was amazing. It's a rush. He smiled up at her across the table, pride shining in his eyes. It is, isn't it? She realized in that moment that it was the first time they'd share the experience of performing in public. Singing at school or during church wasn't the same thing. The rush she'd experienced up on stage, first at the Christmas fair and then during the impromptu concert they'd put on, was something else completely. For the first time, she'd seen a glimpse of why her father did what he did. Why he continued to tour and took opportunities to play in front of a crowd. It was, and the concert was even better. What concert? She couldn't wait to tell him all about it. The words bubbled out while he sat back and listened intently to Miss Doris's idea, the charity it benefited, and how they pulled it all together in a matter of days. He seemed impressed and very interested in the local charity. Is there still time to help with this? he asked when she'd stopped to take a breath. I'd love to make a donation and see if we can help a few more kids. Michelle thought for a moment. I'm not sure there is time to get any more presents unless we drove up to a store somewhere and bought them. We could do that. There's got to be some sort of superstore around that's not entirely sold out yet. It's Christmas Eve, she pointed out. Worth a try, he asked. Why not? It would be nice to have a few more presents to give out. We'd have to wrap them and probably deliver them. Her father nodded in agreement. Let me call Betty Stonewell. She's the one who's been keeping track of the list of kids in need, 
and see what they still need for this year and we can go from there. She pulled her phone out and started scrolling through her contacts. It had grown by quite a few this past week and a half. It was nice that she'd been making so many new friends. I'm sure they wouldn't mind a donation for next year either, she said before she clicked the button to make the call. Consider it done, her father replied with a smile. The stores were crowded, but thankfully, everyone was too busy finishing their last-minute shopping to pay much attention to Michelle and her dad. They both wore hats, sweaters, and jeans, and no one recognized them as they scoured the toy and video game aisles of three different stores in search of just the right last-minute presents. They took them over to the church to wrap and added them to the pile of gifts to be delivered throughout the day. Volunteers were busy driving all over town, arranging secret drop-offs to parents, grandparents, and guardians. While they were wrapping presents, Michelle watched her dad chat with and charm the ladies who had gathered to make sure today's secret Santa mission went off without a hitch. Michelle? Betty was heading her way, a clipboard and pen in hand. Do you think you could make a delivery down toward Georgetown? It's for one of those last-minute presents y'all got. A drive sounds like fun, her dad said, grinning at Betty and Michelle. Sure, we can take it. Where do we need to go, and who are we meeting, she asked. It's a mobile home park. You're meeting the older brother. He's taken over guardianship of his younger siblings. There's two presents to deliver. It's a little tricky though, because both kids are home. I suggest you drive down there, come up with an excuse for why you're there, and then figure out how to deliver the gifts without the younger kids realizing what's going on. Are you up for it? Michelle and her dad nodded. A few minutes later, they were in Michelle's rental car heading south. Any ideas for how we can pull this off? Her dad asked. Michelle thought for a moment. What if we pretend to be from the school district, there to talk about the kids' grades? That should make the younger ones scatter. The plan worked. Both teenagers suddenly remembered they had to visit friends who lived just down the road a few minutes after Michelle and her father arrived. Michelle had grabbed a manila folder and some papers from the back seat of her car. Combined with a pen and a serious expression on her face, it was enough to convince the siblings they were from the school district. Thankfully, neither questioned their casual outfits or the fact that they were working on Christmas Eve. Sometimes it helped that teenagers were clueless. Seth, the oldest of the siblings, was visibly relieved when he found out it had been nothing but a ruse to deliver the presents. Thank you for doing this. I'm barely holding us together. There would have been no presents this year without you guys. It's the first year since our mom passed, he trailed off, choking back tears. Michelle couldn't imagine what it was like to lose an important part of your family and suddenly being faced with the reality of raising two teens on your own. She felt for the guy. Money's pretty tight, her dad guessed. He pulled out his wallet and handed the young man $200 in cash. Take this, he said. Go get a tree and pick up something good for Christmas dinner. He took off the sunglasses he'd been wearing all day. It will get easier. Seth tried to refuse the cash, looked up, and recognition washed over his face. He glanced down at the bills her father had put down and back up at him. Curtis Martell, from Wild Horse? Her dad nodded. Let's keep that on the down low, if you don't mind. I'm here to spend Christmas with my daughter. I recognize you, Seth said, looking at Michelle. You performed with that guy that plays at the coffee shop all the time. I saw the video a couple of days ago. You're really good. Michelle thanked him, and they helped Seth hide the presents before heading back up to Palmer Island. That was nice of you to help him pay for dinner, Michelle said after they'd reached the main road. It was nothing. I wish we could do more. I grew up like that and it's not a lot of fun when you have to decide between paying the power bill or getting food. Michelle knew her father had grown up poor, but she'd never realized how dire their financial situation had been after his own father left. Today, her dad told her of Christmases without gifts and how he'd started working odd jobs and playing at the street corner to make money. 
he'd done everything he could to help his family and vowed to make it big so his own child would never go cold or hungry. She had a feeling it still drove him to work hard. Can I ask you something? Michelle turned to glance at her dad before looking back at the road. Why did it not work out between you and mom? Was it a money thing? In a way, maybe. Her father cleared his throat, and she realized this wasn't something he was comfortable talking about. Part of it was the hours and the time I was away from you guys. But in the end, what it boiled down to was values. Michelle was surprised. I thought it was the groupies and the whole rock and roll lifestyle. That's all mom would talk about when you were on the road. Not quite. I never bought into that, and there weren't a lot of parties or anything. Despite our image, Wild Horse has always been a working band, not a group of guys partying all night. We were all serious about our music and committed to treating this like a business. You can't do that when you're drunk or stoned all the time. It was probably one of the many secrets to their success and longevity. Not too many bands were as successful as his for going on four decades. Michelle thought she'd seriously misjudged her father and his bandmates. I'm not sure what you were talking about earlier. What values didn't line up for you guys? Michelle asked. Your mom wanted to have a more traditional family life. She wanted stability, a house with a white picket fence, barbecues with the neighbors, holidays with the family, that type of thing. Michelle nodded. She could see that. It was the life her mother was living now, with her new husband and Michelle's half-siblings. You wanted something different, she guessed. Her father nodded. I did. I wanted something more. Adventure, excitement and freedom. He stopped for a minute. I didn't want an ordinary life. She did. Michelle could see him shrug out of the corner of her eye. She understood how that could have caused tension in the marriage. What surprised her was that her mother had dated and then married her father in the first place. How did you meet? she asked, realizing this was one story she'd never heard. We went to high school together. I took her out in 10th grade, and we were inseparable until we got accepted to different colleges. I started my first band to help pay for school. Michelle was surprised. She knew her father had played for a long time, but had no idea it had started as a way to pay his way through college. She never even realized he had gone. She'd always assumed he'd gotten into music right out of high school. You graduated? she asked, surprised. High school yes, college no. Her father smiled. The music started taking off, and I ended up skipping class more and more often. I sort of faded out. He shrugged. I figured I'd eventually go back and finish. I think I'm only four credits short of my accounting degree. Michelle snorted. You? An accountant? That was the plan. I don't see it. She was doing everything she could not to burst out laughing. She felt her shoulders shaking and clamped her mouth shut. I can't anymore either. I guess that was the problem. I changed. Your mom didn't. She tried. I give her that. She really tried, but being married to a rock star and raising a child together wasn't exactly a piece of cake. Especially if you expected an accountant with regular hours who would come home from the office at the same time each day. Michelle nodded. She had a new appreciation for her mother. We got married pretty young. I wanted her to join me on the road. She wouldn't get on the tour bus without a ring. We eloped the weekend before Wild Horse's first U.S. tour. I think we shocked both sets of your grandparents. Her dad was staring out the window, lost in memories of days long gone. She had fun at first. We got to travel all over the place. But after a while, it was too much for her. Especially after we had you. Caring for a newborn when you're on the road 10 hours a day isn't ideal. By the time you were ready to start kindergarten, she'd had enough. She said you needed a stable home. I wasn't willing to give up the band. And even if I had been, how could I have done that to the rest of the guys? 
We were all making good money, doing what we loved. I get that. Both sides, actually. It's what worries me about dating Joel. What if we have kids? She didn't realize she'd looked that far into their possible future. It's different these days. The internet makes stuff a lot easier. I've seen a lot of children do well on the road. They take classes online and stay in touch with family and friends while they are gone. And there are a lot of good things about it. How else could you show the world to your kids? If you guys work out and you end up having some. He turned to look at her. That said, I'm not sure I'm ready to be a grandfather. He shuddered. Noted. And you have nothing to worry about. We barely know each other. I only met the guy two weeks ago. Hey, Joel, if you get this in time, my dad and I are heading to lunch at the coffee shop in about 30 minutes. We'd love to have you join us. Call me, text me, or just meet us there. He finished listening to Michelle's voicemail message and checked the time on his phone. If he got in the car right then, he could make it there in time. He changed into a dress shirt and grabbed his keys. It was a good thing that the roasted bean was so close. By the time he walked in, Michelle and her father, Curtis Martel, he still couldn't believe that part, sat at one of the larger tables toward the back of the shop. Michelle's face lit up, and she waved at him as soon as she saw him. That had to be a good sign. Joel wiped his hands on his jeans, put a smile on his face, and strolled toward the table. Joel Fisher, he said, holding his hand out to Michelle's father. Nice to meet you. Glad you could join us for lunch. Mr. Martell motioned for Joel to sit down next to Michelle. Joel leaned over and kissed her cheek, earning him a raised eyebrow from her father. Tell me about yourself, Joel. What do you do? The last thing Joel wanted was to talk about music. He didn't want to give Michelle or her father the impression he was after some help with his own music career. Sure, Curtis Martell could give him great advice and connect him with the right people, but it wasn't the time or the place. And he wasn't sure it was something he'd ever want. He wanted to do the music thing on his own, and more importantly, he didn't want to do anything that could mess things up with the beautiful blonde who sat beside him. He thought about how to best answer the question. I work up in Myrtle Beach at the Carolina Theater. It's a steady job that pays the bills. Those are important, Mr. Martell nodded his approval. What made you decide to live down here? That's quite a drive each day. It's not too bad. With the hours I work, I usually avoid rush hour traffic. To answer your question, I drove all up and down the Grand Strand when I decided to move here. The Grand Strand? Michelle raised her eyebrows. That's what they call the larger Myrtle Beach area, from the north end to down here. I knew I wanted to be close to the water. That was the whole point of the move. He smiled, I checked out a bunch of different places during summertime. This was the calmest and quietest area. When I walked around, I liked it more and more. When I met Mitch over here and had one of these sandwiches, I knew this was the place. Michelle laughed and took a bite of her chicken salad wrap. I can see that. They chatted about anything and everything, including the upcoming holidays and the charity work Miss Doris and the ladies at church did. Whenever the topic of music came up in their conversation, Joel gently steered it into a different direction. By the look Michelle shot him, after the third time, she'd noticed. He hoped she appreciated and realized that he was showing her that he liked her for who she was, not for who she was related to. Curtis Martell turned out to be a pretty interesting guy aside from the music. He'd traveled extensively and read quite a bit. The two men discovered a shared interest in baseball, though they pulled for different teams. All in all, it turned into a fun and relaxing lunch, and as always, the food was delicious. Not that he'd expected anything else at the roasted bean. Mitch walked over to their table and smiled at Michelle. I'm sorry to interrupt, folks. Joel, would you mind stopping by my office before you leave? Joel nodded, and Mitch walked off to take the order of some new arrivals. This is a nice little shop, Curtis said. 
I bet they get a good bit of business in the summer. Not just the summer, Joel answered. It stays pretty busy most of the year. Joel knows the owner and plays here quite a bit, Michelle offered. Her dad nodded and smiled. I love to play these kinds of joints in college. Don't tell anyone, but I kinda miss it. He glanced down at his watch. I hate to cut this short, kids, but I have a call with my team that I can't get out of. Are you about ready? He asked his daughter. She nodded. Do we have time for me to grab some of Mitch's peanut butter bars for Miss Doris? Of course. Joel took his leave and walked Michelle to the counter to place her order. It was nice to meet your dad, he said before giving her a quick hug goodbye. I'll call you later, he promised, then headed behind the counter, through the back, to where Mitch's office was tucked into a corner of the storeroom. Everything okay, he asked, unable to keep the concern out of his voice. Of course. Just making sure you're handling yourself. That's Curtis Martell out there. You realize what he could do for your career, the older man, trailed off. I do, but that's not what this is about. He's Michelle's father. The last thing I want her to think is that I'm hanging out with her to get in with her dad. That's why he'd kept most of their conversation away from music at lunch. Interesting. You really like the girl. It was a statement, not a question. I do, he said. They spent another minute looking over the calendar and Joel committed to a few dates to play in January before he walked back toward the front of the shop to leave. He could hear Michelle and her dad talking before he rounded the corner. It felt wrong to listen to their conversation, but when he heard his name, he couldn't help himself. So, Joel. You like him, he heard Curtis Martell say, his voice carrying far. He had to step a little closer and strain to hear Michelle's reply. I do. I'm kind of surprised how much, she admitted. That's how you know it's the real thing, her father said. I like him. He seems like a good guy. They must be walking toward the door, their voices became softer and softer. The last thing he heard Michelle say as they walked out the door was, and here I thought this was going to be a problem. Joel smiled before he stepped back into the shop to grab a sandwich to take home for dinner. He had the beginnings of a song stuck in his head and couldn't wait to compose as soon as he got home. Chapter 10 Michelle was a few minutes early when she pulled into the parking lot at Shea Paul's, Palmer Island's fanciest restaurant. She pulled down the sun visor and used the small lit mirror to touch up her lipstick and check her hair. She wasn't sure why she felt nervous about this date. She'd seen Joel almost daily for the past two weeks, and they'd shared many a meal. Maybe it was because this was by far the fanciest place they'd been to. Having dinner at Shea Paul's felt more like an official date than anything else they'd done. It was the kind of place you took a girl to if you wanted to propose. But he wouldn't, would he? Michelle shook her head. That would be crazy. They barely knew each other and hadn't had a chance to talk about a possible future together. He just wanted to take her somewhere nice on Christmas Eve, that was all. He'd even invited her father along, but her dad had to bow out at the last minute because of another virtual meeting. From the sound of it, things weren't quite going as planned in London, and he was taking the first plane out the next morning to see what he could do to make the show on the 26th go off without a hitch. Michelle grabbed her purse and headed toward the restaurant. She glanced around for Joel's car. She didn't see it in this part of the parking lot, but that didn't mean he wasn't there already. Even if he hadn't made it yet, she could grab a sparkling water and wait for him at the bar. She strode a little faster, the cold had started to seep through her thin dress and cardigan. It was the nicest outfit she'd brought and the only thing that had seemed appropriate for a fancy dinner date. She hoped it was dressy enough and didn't scream church clothes. The high heels and jewelry she'd added dressed the outfit up, along with the cute patent leather clutch she'd picked up at one of the local stores earlier in the week. Michelle glanced around the restaurant as she entered. The hostess confirmed Joel had not yet arrived, but there was a reservation under his name. She offered to take Michelle to their table, and before long, 
she sat tucked into a booth in the corner, a sparkling water with lime in front of her. Michelle played with the straw and kept one eye on the door, waiting for Joel to walk through. She wondered if he'd be dressed up for their date as well. He probably had to be, she didn't think they would let anyone in without a jacket and tie. At least the people watching was good. The place filled up quickly, and there was an interesting mix of guests to observe. It seemed they weren't the only couple who had chosen to enjoy their Christmas Eve meal here. She watched an older couple in their mid-seventies enjoy matching filet mignon and salads. They shared a bottle of wine and seemed to be comfortable eating silently in each other's company. The man, who Michelle assumed was the woman's husband, noticed the moment she'd finished her wine and poured her more. The sweet smile she sent him in thanks made Michelle's heart melt. It was plain to see that they loved each other deeply despite the lack of obvious physical affection between them. The young couple at the table next to them were the opposite. If she had to guess, she'd say it was their first Christmas together. They couldn't keep their hands off each other and continually fed each other bites of their food. It was cute, but a little much, even for young love. Michelle couldn't picture herself and Joel acting like that. Holding hands under the table was one thing, but this was close to turning into a scene from Lady and the Tramp. It was a good thing neither one of them had ordered the pasta dish. Michelle smiled to herself at the thought and took another sip of her water. She glanced down at the phone. Joel was fifteen minutes late, and there was no message from him, which was strange. Aside from the car incident on their first date, he'd always been pretty punctual. When the waitress stopped by for the second time to ask if she was ready to order, Michelle decided it was time to go. He was now twenty minutes late and hadn't responded to either of her text messages. She tried not to worry that something may have happened to him on the way, and to not get angry about being stood up. She'd head home, scramble some eggs for herself and her dad, and withhold judgment until she'd heard from Joel. Walking out of the restaurant without her date and without having ordered was embarrassing. The waitress had told her not to worry about paying for the sparkling water. She'd smiled at Michelle with enough pity in her eyes that it was clear she'd thought Michelle had been stood up. And she had been. Despite her best efforts, anger rose as she stomped back to her car. She wondered why she was so surprised. He was a musician like her dad, and if there was one thing she'd learned over and over again growing up, it was that you couldn't count on them. Why had she convinced herself Joel would be different? The drive back to Miss Doris's house didn't do much to calm her either, and it wasn't long before she'd pulled into her regular spot in front of the house. She opened the front door and entered quietly. She'd gotten word earlier that Sarah had delivered a healthy baby boy, and Michelle wasn't sure if they'd been discharged already. She didn't want to risk waking anyone. She tiptoed quietly into the house and closed the door without a sound. By the time she'd shrugged out of her shoes and picked them up, she heard voices in the living room. It sounded like her father and Joel. That was strange. What was he doing at Miss Doris's? Curiosity getting the better of her, she quietly walked down the hall toward the sound of quiet conversation. She didn't mean to snoop, not really, but couldn't help it when her name came up. The door to the living room wasn't quite closed, and she saw the two men sitting across from each other, a small fire roaring in the fireplace. They looked deep in conversation. Sometimes all you need is a leg up. I don't blame you for taking advantage where you can, she heard her dad say. And good for you keeping it a secret from Michelle. That's definitely the right call. I'm glad you agree, Joel said. I'm still not sure how she'd take it. I say don't worry about it and see how it goes. Not all women are like her mom. Michelle couldn't believe what she heard. Not only was Joel chatting up her dad when he was supposed to be having a romantic dinner with her, he was obviously making plans for his music career and getting her dad to help. Worst of all, her father was in on it and suggested that they keep it a secret from her. Her head spun, and her heart was cracking in two. She was losing not one, but two people in her life tonight. But could she call it losing if neither had really loved her to begin with? Her chest constricted. 
Michelle had to fight for every shallow breath while her heartbeat drummed louder and louder in her ears. She had to get out of there, had to get some air, and she definitely had to get away from the men in the living room. The two men who had shattered her heart into pieces. Tears rolled down her cheeks, and she didn't see Miss Doris until she bumped into the older woman in her rush to get to the front door and out of the house. Sorry, she stammered, before pushing off and stepping around her friend. She staggered to the door, snatching her car keys off the counter. Before she slammed the door shut, she heard Miss Doris call her name. She couldn't stop. Couldn't risk facing Joel or her father. Joel glanced at his phone after pulling into the driveway at Miss Doris's house. He was running late. He hoped Michelle and her father hadn't left. He jogged up the path to the door and rang the bell. Curtis Martell opened the door, confusion spreading over his face as his eyes skimmed over Joel. What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to have dinner with my daughter? He stepped aside and motioned for Joel to enter. I'm here to pick both of you up. It was Joel's turn to be confused. That was the plan, wasn't it? Originally. You must have missed some messages. Come on in and let's get this straightened out. Michelle's father rubbed his arms and Joel realized how cool it had gotten. He stepped inside and closed the door behind him. He followed the other man into the living room. Take a seat. A warm fire crackled in the fireplace and he saw a laptop sitting on the coffee table. Did I interrupt something? Joel asked. Not at all. My team is working out a few details. We're supposed to regroup in 45 minutes, Curtis replied after glancing down at his watch. Sit down and warm up. Where's Michelle? he asked after peeling off his jacket and hanging it over a chair by the fire. Still getting ready? No, she headed out to run some errands before meeting you at the restaurant. You have some time to kill before the reservation. Joel nodded. He must have gotten the exact time mixed up. There was no reason to show up at the restaurant early. He would stay and chat for a bit and then drive over to meet Michelle. He reached over to the jacket hanging on the chair to make sure the small wrapped box was still in his pocket. He saw Curtis glance up at him, one eyebrow raised. That better not be what I think it is. The man's tone was serious. Joel pulled the box out of his pocket and set it on the table in between them. It took him a moment to realize the other man thought he'd bought a ring. A ring to propose to his daughter. Oh, no. Nothing like that. Not that I don't like her, he stammered, heat creeping up from his neck and into his cheeks. He was fairly certain the tips of his ears glowed red as well. It always happened when he got embarrassed, and it was one of the main reasons he wore hats and had let his hair grow out a bit. Too bad he'd gotten it freshly cut before his big date with Michelle. Take a breath, man. I'm just giving you a hard time. The tone of Curtis's voice was much lighter and, unless Joel was mistaken, he tried hard to suppress a grin. You got her a gift though, good thinking. He nodded his approval. What did you pick? First presents are a tough choice. I completely messed it up with Michelle's mom. Trust me, a signed copy of your demo album is not the way to go. She threw it back at me after she opened it. It was a cassette tape too. I'm sure she thought she was opening a piece of jewelry, he chuckled, looking lost in the memory. It probably wasn't all that funny at the time. Joel sympathized with the man. Picking the right first gift was hard. He had agonized over the choice for days and visited the local jewelry shop three different times before making his final selection, and then only after he'd consulted with Miss Doris. She'd assured him the silver piece he'd selected would be perfect. It's a silver charm bracelet with a few charms to represent our time together. A palm tree for the island, a Christmas ornament, and a musical note for our performances together. It felt strange to share these symbols of their relationship with her father, but Curtis Martell nodded and smiled. Miss Doris helped me with the final selection. She thought it was appropriate. 
He wondered if the older man would judge him for needing help to pick his girlfriend's Christmas gift. Joel looked up. He thought he'd heard the front door shut. No sounds of approaching footsteps or voices carried down the hall and the living room door was cracked partially open. He must have been mistaken. They continued their conversation. Sometimes all you need is a leg up. I don't blame you for taking advantage where you can, Curtis said, picking up the wrapped box and moving it from one hand to the other. And good for you keeping it a secret from Michelle. That's definitely the right call. I'm glad you agree, Joel said. I'm still not sure how she'll take it. I say don't worry about it and see how it goes. Not all women are like her mom. Joel raised his head. This time he was certain he'd heard the front door open. He saw Curtis look up as well. Then, he would have sworn he'd heard Michelle's voice before Miss Doris called out her name. What was going on? And what was Michelle doing back at the house? Chapter 11 Michelle startled awake at the sound of someone knocking on the window of her car. She was cold, and her back had cramped. She blinked her eyes open and saw both Joel and her father through the driver's side window. Joel stopped knocking, and they both expressed equal parts worry and relief on their faces. Michelle rolled her shoulders, rubbed her hands together to warm them, and then opened the car door. What are you doing here? she asked. She'd hoped to avoid seeing both of them for a while. A long while. What are you doing sleeping in your car at the airport? Her father boomed. This isn't exactly safe, you know. His tone softened some. Joel pushed the door of her car open all the way. Cold early morning air rushed in and she wrapped her arms around herself in an effort to hang on to the last bit of warmth. He shrugged out of his winter jacket and handed it to her. Here. Take this. She stepped out of the car and took the offered jacket. She put it on over her own wool sweater, thankful for the warmth and the comfort it provided. It smelled like Joel and tears sprung in her eyes, memories from the night before and what she'd heard flooded her mind. She had run when she'd realized Joel wasn't interested in her, only in what her father could do for his career. Yet, here he was at five in the morning. What are you doing here? she asked. Her father snorted. What do you think? We've been looking for you all night, Joel said, his voice heavy with worry. He looked tired. They both did. What happened? Why did you leave? Miss Dora said she saw you running out the door, looking upset. Michelle swallowed hard. The whole point of running out and heading to the airport to catch the next plane home had been to avoid having this conversation. With either of them. But from the looks of it, she wasn't getting out of it. She cleared her throat and leaned against the side of her car. I heard you talking in the living room. And, they asked, in unison. She couldn't believe their gall. The anger flared back up in her chest, and she pushed off the car to pace around the parking lot. First, she held up one finger. You stand me up at the restaurant. I sat there waiting for you, she pointed accusingly at Joel with her outstretched index finger, to join me for dinner. You never showed. Do you know what that feels like? Everyone was staring at me. The waitress wouldn't even let me pay for my drink. I, Joel opened his mouth to speak, but she stared him down. I'm not done. Her tone made it clear she was in no mood for interruptions. Joel shut his mouth and motioned for her to continue. Then, I get back to the house and find you both there in the living room, cozy as kittens. Neither one of you seemed to care that you'd left me waiting. And if that wasn't bad enough, she took a deep breath. If that wasn't bad enough, I heard what you were talking about. Her shoulders slumped, she felt deflated. The anger had burned itself out and all that remained was pain and disappointment. She couldn't stand to look at the two men who meant so much to her but had disappointed and hurt her so deeply. She turned around and looked inside her car. Anything to avoid looking at her father or Joel. What do you think we were talking about? Joel asked softly. Isn't it obvious? 
You were talking about your music career and how my dad can help you get it off the ground. She felt his hand on her shoulder. Look at me, he said. Michelle turned around and faced him. We weren't talking about my music. I swear. Michelle looked up into his eyes. He seemed sincere. Could she trust him, though? What were you talking about? She replayed the conversation in her mind, trying to figure out what it could have been instead. We were talking about you and the Christmas present he bought you. Her father stepped up and clapped his hand on Joel's shoulder. But you were talking about taking advantage and secrets and mom. Michelle heard the confusion in her voice. The secret part would make sense if they were talking about a gift, but what about the rest? I wasn't sure how you were feeling about me, about us. I don't want to stop seeing you after you leave, and I was hoping the right gift would help with that. And I wasn't sure if what I picked would get that point across. Joel shrugged. He looked a little lost and hurt. Part of her ate to reach out and hug him. Anything to wipe that sad and tired look off his face and get the smiling Joel with the sparkling eyes back. But part of her wasn't convinced yet, and she held back. There was too much at stake here. Her heart being the main one. I told him about the first gift I gave your mother and how she threw it back in my face, her father explained. I don't think you'll be tempted. I've seen what he got you. You're going to like it. He smiled at her encouragingly. That still doesn't explain the restaurant. Michelle stepped back and crossed her arms in front of her chest. Why did you stand me up? I was waiting for a good half an hour for you. That can't be right. Joel rubbed his hand over his face, scrubbing his cheeks as if to wake up. I came to the house to pick you guys up, and I'd only been there a few minutes, before you stormed out. He looked over at her father for help. I don't think we spent more than 15 minutes talking. If that long. Why were you at the house at all? I texted you to meet me at the restaurant. Michelle knew her voice sounded accusatory, but she couldn't help it. She was tired, cranky, cold, hungry, and her patience with these two was running out. Yet, she held on to a little glimmer of hope that flared up in the back of her heart. What if it had all been some sort of misunderstanding? I didn't get a message from you. Joel pulled up his phone and started scrolling. When did you send it? Michelle turned and dug her phone out of her purse. She pulled up her texting app, oh, she turned back to face him and showed him her phone. I never sent it. She felt heat rise in her cheeks. My dad couldn't make it to dinner, and I had some things to take care of in town. I typed up a message for you to meet me at the restaurant but I didn't actually send it. Ah, uh, that explains it. To her surprise, Joel didn't look too upset. I don't know why you were there so early though. Our reservation wasn't until 8.30. It was at 7.30. She turned to look at her dad. You called the restaurant a little after 4 and told them you wanted a table in about 3 hours. He nodded. That's right, but it was later than that, wasn't it? I texted Joel the time as soon as I got off the phone. He looked at his watch and squinted. He looked again before turning to Joel, what time is it? Right now? It's 5.05 a.m. Hmm. I'm sorry you guys. I think I'm the cause for the confusion. I messed up the time change when I changed my watch after I got off the plane yesterday. I'm off by an hour. He looked embarrassed. I'm sorry, honey. It was my fault you were sitting at the restaurant by yourself. Can you forgive me? He walked over and put his arms around Michelle. I'm really sorry I let you down again, he whispered into her ear. I'll find a way to make it up to you. I promise. Michelle returned the hug. It's okay. I know you didn't do it on purpose. It was an honest mistake. She was surprised to find that she really meant it. And it had been an easy mistake to make. For the first time in a while, she had no doubt in her heart that her father hadn't been careless. He'd felt bad about cancelling their dinner plans initially, and insisted on her and Joel going. 
he'd wanted to treat them to a nice, romantic dinner. Hey, Joel, would you mind walking up to the terminal and grabbing us some coffee? he asked over his shoulder. Michelle, could you something to warm her up after spending the night in the car? It was the best idea she'd heard all morning, and Joel seemed to agree. He rushed off without a second glance at her. Listen, I don't have a lot of time, her father said, running his fingers through his hair, before dropping his arm and grabbing her hand. I have to leave for London in a few. It's later than I thought it was, but there are some things I need to say. His voice was serious, and his eyes plead with hers. Do you want to sit in the car? he asked. Michelle shook her head. She was too anxious about what the conversation could be about to sit. This is fine. It was cold and dark, sunrise still a few hours away, and the wetness of the early morning dew had started to seep into her bones. Okay, her father cleared his throat and was quiet for a moment. I'm not good at these father-daughter talk things, so bear with me, please. She nodded but couldn't keep a small smile from making her lips twitch. This better not be one of those talks about the birds and the bees. She was a bit old for that conversation. About Joel. He's right. We didn't talk about his music. At all. To be honest, I'm kinda impressed with how hard he's been working to avoid the topic at all cost. I've been trying to get him to talk about it and he changes the subject on me each time. Michelle felt relieved. This didn't sound like it was the start of the talk. She was curious where her father was going with this, though she had to admit, it made her feel better to know Joel wasn't using her to get to her dad. In fact, it sounded like he was doing everything he could to make it clear that he wasn't in the relationship to use her. Maybe she had let her old fears break through. And maybe, just maybe, it was her mother's prejudices talking when those fears popped into her head. At the very least, today was giving her a lot to think about when it came to her relationship with Joel. The boy has talent. He could make it big if he finishes that demo and gets it into the right hands. If you ask me, he has what it takes to make it in this biz, and I don't say that lightly. He put his arm around Michelle and pulled her close. She appreciated the gesture and the warmth. You think so? I do. He has a good voice. Something fresh and unique. And he seems to have the work ethic. Making it as a professional musician means long hours in the studio and on the road. It's not for everyone. Michelle nodded. She'd seen her share of people come and go as she'd followed her father's career. And that way of life hadn't been for her mother. She'd thought it was out of the question for her, too, but she'd started to second-guess that decision. Maybe it was something she should at least reconsider. After all, if her father was right and Joel would make it, she'd have to choose. Life with a professional musician or without him. And you're thinking of helping him, she guessed. I am. I had some people open doors for me in the early days. It's time I gave back. Unless you'd rather I didn't. He took a step back and looked at her. I know how you feel about all this. You say the word and I'll make sure his demo doesn't go anywhere. She hoped he was joking, but her father looked dead serious. Don't do that. Which one? She could see a glimmer of mirth in his eyes. Don't make sure no one will listen to his demo. Just to be clear, you want me to help the boy out? Get his career started? She nodded. Yes. It came out soft and unsure. Yes, she repeated more firmly. Help him. The world deserves to hear his music. And he deserves to make his dreams come true. That's my girl. I heard you guys sing together, by the way. Just on a crappy cell phone recording, but it was enough to tell that you two have something special. And I don't think it's just the music. He glanced down at his watch. I have to go, honey. The airport is about to open and I'm on the first plane back to London. He hugged her tightly for a moment. Are you going to be okay? She nodded against his chest. Thanks for coming, she mumbled. It had been a brief visit, but it had been nice to have him here, even with all the drama. Merry Christmas. 
he reached into his pocket and pulled an envelope out of it. This is for you. Don't open it just yet. Save it for later today. She nodded and grabbed the small letter. Her own gift for her father was stuck in the closet at Miss Doris's house. She told him about it, a single tear rolling down her cheek. He used his thumb to wipe it away. Don't worry about it. You're my real Christmas gift. Anything else can wait until I'm back from London. I'll come up and see you as soon as I get back. She nodded, and he turned to leave. Merry Christmas, Daddy, she called after him. He turned for a moment and smiled. By the time Joel returned with three steaming cups of coffee, her father had long disappeared into the departure terminal of the airport. Joel shrugged when she told him. More crappy coffee for us. The deadpan comment made her smile, and she realized that's why he'd said it. Get in the car, and turn on the heat, he suggested. Your lips are turning blue. This didn't come as a surprise. It always happened when she was cold. Even a quick dip in the pool or the ocean would result in purplish-blue lips, and she felt a little too much like a popsicle after their chat in the damp, early morning air. It might have been South Carolina, but it still got cold on December mornings, before the sun came up. The car slowly warmed up, and they both sipped scalding hot coffee. Feeling better? he asked after a few minutes. Michelle nodded. Good. I was hoping you could give me a ride back to town. I came with your dad, and I have to go turn in his rental. Of course, she said. I couldn't leave you stranded on Christmas Day. Even if you did stand me up at the restaurant last night. She punched him in the shoulder, not hard, but with enough force to make him spill coffee all over his jeans. Michelle burst out laughing. She thought back to the first time they'd met. At, at least, she sputtered in between giggles. At least it isn't a white chocolate mocha. Joel joined in while dabbing the hot liquid off his pants. Thanks for small blessings. At least my clothes won't stick to me this time. I doubt I have time to go change. It took a moment for his last words to register. This was Christmas Day and that meant he had the recording studio for this one day to create his demo album. The album that would potentially make or break his career. And he'd spent all night looking for her. Oh, Joel. The words stuck in her throat and she had to swallow hard around the large lump that had formed. You're supposed to record today. You've been up all night. You've got to be exhausted. I'm so sorry. I wasn't thinking when I ran out last night. She couldn't suppress the sob that worked its way out of her mouth. Tears streamed down her face. I've ruined it. I've ruined everything. Joel took his spot at the microphone in the small soundproof booth. The sound engineer he'd hired, who frankly was a student from the local college with a little mixing board experience, tested different levels and tracks while Michelle sat next to the guy smiling at Joel encouragingly, through the glass. She still had dark rings around her eyes, but looked much better after he'd gotten some food into her. After her breakdown in the car, and his assurances that she hadn't ruined anything and that he was as much to blame for their misunderstanding, he'd insisted they go out for breakfast. He'd returned her dad's rental car, then driven straight to the first breakfast place. Thankfully, it was open at the crack of dawn on Christmas morning and he'd ordered them each a stack of pancakes and an omelet to share. The food had revived them, and now that he was in the studio, adrenaline pumped through his system. He was itching to get started and hoped the engineer would hurry up and give him the green light. Joel said a quick prayer and hoped the adrenaline and sugar kept him going long enough to record a decent demo. He had to make it work or spend the next few years hustling and saving to give it another shot. The green light came on, the guy behind the glass gave him the thumbs up, and the first notes played in his headphones. It was time to sing his heart out. Michelle looked around the large table in Miss Doris's formal dining room. They had all gathered for Christmas dinner. Miss Doris sat at the head of the table, Ryan's grandfather, Joe Beckheim, by her side. Next to him were Ryan and Sarah. 
Their newborn son, Charlie, slept peacefully in a small bassinet in the corner. Sarah's mother, Marianne, sat across from them, next to Michelle. And then there was Joel. He was on her right, holding her hand under the table. The Christmas she'd thought would be sad and lonely after her father bailed on her turned out to be one of the richest and coziest she remembered in years. These people, who were strangers a few weeks ago, had become close friends. More than that. They were family. Just as her mother, Dawn, and the boys were family. And her father. She'd opened his letter during a quiet moment in the recording studio. Wrapped around a picture of her she'd never seen, where she was riding on his shoulders as a young child, there was a brief note. Baby girl. You're never far from my thoughts or my heart no matter where this crazy road takes us. I'm so proud of the strong woman you've become, and I can't wait to see what's ahead for you next. I'll always be there for you, no matter what. Love. Dad. P.S. This is a copy of the picture I've been carrying around for the past 20 years. Thought you'd like it. See you soon. Michelle glanced down at the silver bracelet on her wrist and touched the worn picture tucked into her pocket. Gifts from the two most important men in her life. Proof that they loved her and cared for her. She looked up and saw Joel smiling at her. The sparkle was back in his eyes, and despite the long day in the recording studio, he didn't look nearly as tired as he had that morning. Dig in. Miss Doris swept her hand over the spread in front of him. Somehow, the woman had managed to bake a ham and whip up all sorts of delicious sides. When did you have time to cook all this? Michelle asked. Miss Doris had spent most of the day before at the hospital as Sarah gave birth and the morning preparing for Sarah and Ryan's impromptu wedding. I had a lot of help, Miss Doris replied, reaching over to squeeze her niece's hand. Marianne here makes the best sweet potato casserole. And you, my dear, are the master of flaky biscuits, Grandpa Joe chimed in. Michelle suppressed a giggle when she saw Miss Doris beam at him in gratitude. She wondered if there was something going on between those two. They had seemed thick as thieves the past few days. Michelle was sad that she'd missed Sarah's big day, but the time spent with Joel in the recording studio had been eye-opening. He was dedicated, hardworking, and a really good musician. They'd listened to the digital recording of his small demo album in the car on the way here, and it was as good as anything she'd heard on the radio recently. Better really, because the lyrics he'd written had depth, and the music itself built up layer after layer. A lot of thought had gone into each of his songs, and it showed. In the end, Michelle had joined Joel for a duet in the recording studio. Listening to her own voice on the recording was strange, but her father had been right. Their voices blended beautifully together, and she was glad she'd been able to share the experience with Joel. She hoped something would come of the recording, and with her father's help, she was sure Joel would get the shot he deserved. She couldn't wait to hear back from her dad after his show tomorrow and share it with him. Did Curtis make it to London okay? Miss Doris asked from across the table. The woman must have been a mind reader. He did. It was an easy flight, and the plane was half empty. He's busy getting ready for the big concert tomorrow. He had called her as soon as he'd landed, making sure she was feeling better and that things were back on track with Joel. That they were. She couldn't believe how happy she was with him by her side. She couldn't see a future without him and hoped he felt the same way. He'd even met her mother via video chat before dinner and that conversation had gone a lot better than expected. Michelle had been worried she'd get a lecture from her mom about dating a musician, but there had been none of that. Instead, her mom had been genuinely happy for them, and invited them to come spend a few days with her and her family early next year. For the first time in a long time, Michelle actually looked forward to seeing her mother, her stepdad, and her half-brothers. After much food, much laughter, and an enjoyable Christmas dinner all around, Michelle found herself wanting some quiet time with Joel. Would you like to go sit out on the back deck with me for a little while? she asked. I know it's pretty cold out there, but we could light a fire and look at the stars. How could I say no to that? 
Joel smiled at her, and Michelle's heart melted. Do you mind, she asked Miss Doris. Of course not. There's plenty of firewood out there. You two have fun. Marianne and I are going to take the last of the dishes to the kitchen and call it a night. It's been a long day. She yawned before grabbing two of the bowls still sitting on the dining room table. Thank you for a lovely Christmas dinner, Joel said. I haven't had anything like it in a while. He sounded wistful. You're very welcome. I'm glad you joined us. She walked toward the door that led out into the hallway and down to the kitchen before turning. Come back any time. I mean that. Both of you. We will, Michelle replied before grabbing a warm blanket off the living room couch and heading outside. Joel lit a cozy little fire, and it wasn't long before the two of them were snuggled up in one of the oversized lounge chairs, the blanket wrapped tightly around them. Make a wish, Joel said, pointing to a shooting star that raced across the dark horizon over the ocean. She closed her eyes. I wish we could be like this forever, she said. You're not supposed to say your wish out loud, Joel chided, hugging her closer, to soften the impact of his words. She knew he was joking, but couldn't help correcting him. It's fine if your wish is already coming true. At least I hope it is. She held her breath, waiting for his response. Um? The sound was a question. At least she took it for one and plunged in. What would you say if I told you I turned in my notice at work to come stay down here? It had been a huge step to email her principal before dinner, but somehow the decision had felt right. She'd been surprised to get a reply on Christmas Day. He had asked her to finish out the school year and was sorry to see her go. Overall, though, he'd been understanding and offered to write her a recommendation that would make it easier to find work in South Carolina or wherever they ended up come summer. She looked up at Joel. He seemed stunned, and Michelle wasn't sure how to take it. Was it too much too soon? Was she overstepping? Maybe it wasn't anything more than a little holiday fling for him after all. Doubt reared its ugly head, and her heart pounded so hard she was pretty sure he could hear it. Heck, the people upstairs probably could as well. Michelle was about to get up and run when Joel cleared his throat. I think it's the best Christmas gift I've ever gotten, he said before hugging her closer and kissing her senseless. Epilogue Seven months later I'm calling Miss Doris. Michelle cracked open her laptop and opened the video call app. Hi, honey? Where are you guys? Miss Doris asked. As usual, she was shouting into the screen. We just made it into Colorado. We should get to Denver tonight and set up for the concert in Red Rocks tomorrow. Don't forget to send me a postcard. Miss Doris got up and walked around, her tablet in hand. Michelle had to look away from her screen for a moment to avoid getting seasick. She was fine riding in their tour bus for 12 hours a day, but Miss Doris's insistence on walking around with the camera on to show her something around the house or Palmer Island made her sick to her stomach. I won't forget she reassured her friend. I have them all up on the fridge. Miss Doris turned the tablet around to show her the refrigerator that was covered in quite a few postcards from all over the United States. It was a nice little recap of their journey crisscrossing the country as Joel and his band toured as the opening act for Wild Horse. Michelle made a mental note to ask Sarah to take a picture of the fridge. It would make a fun Instagram post and a cool way to announce the rest of their tour dates. How is the teaching going? Still having fun? I am. It's nice to only have to worry about three students. Since joining her father and Joel on the road, Michelle had been teaching the school-aged children of fellow band members. It started out as something to do to occupy her time, but to her surprise, she found the experience extremely rewarding. The kids ranged in age from 6 to 14, making it a bit of a challenge to teach them all at the same time, but Michelle had embraced it and run with it. Now, she thrived on the one-on-one -on -one interactions and the strong relationships she had started to build with her students. I'm taking them to the Museum of Nature and Science tomorrow. Hi, Miss Doris. 
Joel walked up and squeezed into the small booth of the bus where they worked and ate, and where Michelle did much of her teaching while the countryside rolled by outside the large picture windows of the bus. How's the music going? Still enjoying this touring thing, or are you ready to come back? Miss Doris's gray eyes crinkled with mirth. She knew very well that it was Joel's dream, what he had worked towards since he'd first moved to Palmer Island. Oh, you know, it's a job. I'm hanging in there, but the next time you are in the roasted bean, would you mind asking Mitch if I can have my old gig back? Michelle giggled listening to Joel, tease her back. I'll do that. He's been asking about you. I told him about our little video chats, and I think he felt left out. You should call him. Miss Doris's tone was more serious now. I will, Joel promised. The past few months had been busy, and Michelle still couldn't believe how much her life had changed since Christmas. She'd finished out the school year in Pennsylvania, then joined the guys on tour. Since then, she'd seen more of the country than she had since she was a little girl. To her surprise, she didn't miss her apartment or her regular work hours. Life on the road was fun and exciting. Every day brought a new adventure. We have some news to share, Joel said, reminding Michelle of the reason for the day's call. She held her hand up to the camera so the brand new diamond ring was in focus. We got engaged, she blurted out excitedly. On the other side of the screen, Miss Doris's hand flew to her mouth, and her eyes went wide. Oh, it's stunning. Congratulations, to both of you. I'm so happy for you. Tell me everything. When and where did he propose? When are you getting married? Are you coming down here? What's the plan? Oh. I'm so excited for you. When Miss Doris finally stopped chattering to take a breath, Michelle got a chance to answer the myriad of questions. It was so romantic. He went all out. Michelle could see the tips of Joel's ears turning red as she launched into the retelling of his proposal from a few days ago. We were out in Moab, and he dragged me out to Arches National Park super early in the morning. We hiked out to Delicate Arch, that's the big one in the last postcard we sent, and made it there just as the sun was starting to come up. I bet that was beautiful. It was, Joel chimed in. I have some pictures. I'll send them to you in a little while. Miss Doris nodded her thanks. And then? It was pretty crowded, Joel picked up the tail. It took me a little by surprise. I thought we were out there early, before anyone else, but apparently it's a pretty popular spot for photographers to shoot the sunrise. It was so beautiful. It took my breath away, Michelle said. She looked over at Joel, her hand reaching up to cup his check. We walked off to a quiet spot and sat on a rock. He pretended to look for some snacks in his bag. She turned to look back at the screen. He got down on one knee and held a small box out to me. She could hear Miss Doris gasp, reliving the moment right along with them. I was completely surprised. I had no idea he was doing this. He asked me to marry him. And she said yes. Joel's voice was full of pride and joy. Of course she did. She's a smart girl. Miss Doris beamed at the two of them through the screen. I wish I could hug you both. We miss you too. And the island. How are Sarah, Ryan, and the baby? Michelle asked. They'd left when little Charlie was still a newborn. Sarah had sent a few pictures, but it wasn't the same as holding him and breathing in that baby smell. They are fine. Charlie has figured out how to roll and is getting into all kinds of trouble. Did I tell you that they finally moved into their new house, two months ago? Michelle shook her head. It was news to her, but she was happy for her friend and their little family. Engaged? Miss Doris shook her head like she couldn't quite believe it yet. When is the big day? Any plans for a wedding yet? Actually, we do. We won't be all that far from Las Vegas in a couple of weeks, and we decided to drive out and get married in a cute little chapel. Please tell me you're not having Elvis marry you. Miss Doris looked incredulous. No. 
I promise it will be nice, and I'll make sure Dad takes lots of pictures to send your way. That would be nice. I'm sorry I won't be there. She heard the regret in Miss Doris's voice. Me too. Both of us actually. Michelle reached back and squeezed Joel's arm. That's why we want to ask you something. Joel paused for a moment, as if to make sure he had Miss Doris's attention. Which was ridiculous. The woman's eyes were practically glued to the screen. Michelle poked him in the ribs. We were hoping we could rent out the cabin early in the fall when we're on break and enlist your help in organizing a little wedding party for our Palmer Island friends. That sounds like a wonderful idea, Miss Doris clutched her chest, eyes glittering with joy. It will be a lot of fun to put together. I'll be making the cake of course. And I'm sure we can talk Amy into doing your flowers. Even if I'm not sure how much longer she'll keep the shop open now that, well, never mind all that. I'm sure I can talk her into it. How many people are you expecting? I could look into renting the parish hall where we had the bake sale. Hold your horses, Michelle said in hopes of reining her in. We're not that far yet. How about we get married first? I'm just glad you're on board. We can't wait to come home for a few weeks. Because after everything that had happened in those few short weeks on Palmer Island, it had become home, and Michelle had a feeling that no matter where they traveled or what they saw, it always would be. The End This has been All He Wants for Christmas. Written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2019 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.